Sergeants, you may begin your recordings. PC recording started. Backup recording started. Sergeant Polite, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the remote hearing on a committee on immigration, jointly with the committee on youth services. Will all council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Buenos dias a todos. I'm Carlos Menchaca, chair of the City Council's Committee on Immigration. Today, the Committee on Immigration is joined by the Committee on Youth Services. And I wanna welcome uh, Council Member and Chair Debbie Rose from Staten Island. We also have uh, members of the committees here, Council Member Drum, Council Member Lewis, and Council Member Chin. Today, we are conducting an oversight on the city's adult literacy programming, highlighting the gaps in adult literacy and digital literacy in our immigrant communities. Today's hearing has special significance to me. Having been raised in a non-English speaking household, I know firsthand the burden of translating from my mom, a single mom. Our family needed access to government resources like food, healthcare, and housing. I know the difficulty of accessing basic services. And when all that information was available in English and poorly translated to Spanish, it was hard. That's what our families are experiencing today. Adult literacy is a national issue. Regardless of country of origin, in the US, more than 36 million adults cannot read or write in English. Of these, only 10% of adults in need of literacy education receive services. More than two thirds of all literacy programs in the country struggle with long student waiting lists. For many of the adult literacy providers who've joined us today, the picture painted by national data is not foreign to New York City. 2009 data released by the United Neighborhood Houses found that 2.2 million adult New Yorkers or one third of all adult New Yorkers lack English proficiency. Of those, at least 15,000 New Yorkers are on waiting lists for adult literacy classes as of 2015. And that's according to the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy. I expect that we may hear updates of these numbers during the public panel portion of today's hearing. Immigrant New Yorkers are disproportionately impacted by low literacy levels. Half of all immigrant New Yorkers identify as limited English proficient, more than twice their US born counterparts. Low literacy and English language proficiency among parents has direct ties to lower educational outcomes of their children. And we see all of this in the New York City data, where nearly a quarter of children growing up in mixed status immigrant homes tend to be less proficient in English, English themselves, compared to just 5% of their US born peers. The last six months have highlighted an additional barrier to immigrant New Yorkers, a gap in digital literacy. As programming and services have, and as programming and services have gone from in-person to online and remote, we can ignore that at least one fourth of foreign born workers have limited digital skills in 2020. This could mean that as many as one in four immigrant New Yorkers have struggled to access any number of critical services over the last six months and may continue to do so. If we do not offer additional support to bridge the digital literacy gap. In the most destabilizing year of the last century, we must not lose sight of our investment in the next generation. As such, we expect to hear a commitment from the administration to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers are able to access adult literacy classes and to hear how remote based programs and services have fought to retain immigrant constituencies. I wanna thank Chair Rose, uh, Chair of the Committee on Youth and Services, uh, Youth Services, and also on the BNT for joining this hearing today as well as the staff behind the scenes, making sure that the online hearing runs smoothly. I'd like to thank committee chair uh, or committee staff for their work, 
committee counsel Harbani Ahuja, policy analyst Elizabeth Kronk, finance unit head Krillian Francisco, and finance analyst Florentine uh, Kabori. Youth Services Committee staff include Paul Senegal, who's the committee counsel, policy analyst uh, Anastasia Zemina, finance unit head Aisha Wright, finance analyst Michelle Pergreen. Big thank you to my staff as well, my chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, and legislative director, Cesar Vargas. And with that, I want to turn it over to my co-chair for remarks, Chair Rose. Good morning, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I want to thank everyone, and I want to especially thank Councilmember Menchaca for sharing your personal perspectives on today's hearing. You know, your experiences echo the experiences of countless immigrants in New York City. They are very well appreciated, and I want to acknowledge and thank you for sharing them. I'm Council Member Debbie Rose. I'm the chair of the Youth Services Committee, and I would like to extend a very warm welcome and thank you to our literacy advocates, our program providers, and everyone who's testifying here today. I also want to thank the Department of Youth and Community Development. Your programs touch more lives than many of our other city agencies combined, and your impact is appreciated. I'd also like to thank the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. You are a vital part of today's discussion, and you are also making an important impact in the quality of life in our, uh, life in our immigrant communities. We are looking forward to hearing from both of you today. But as an oversight body, we must ask you tough questions, and we must push you to do more because New Yorkers need your support even more today during, during today's trying times, your literacy programs are so important and we need, and they need your support. Every September, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, observes International Literacy Day. Last year's 219 theme was which, seem, which seems so very long ago, um, was literacy and multilingualism. This year's theme, however, focuses on literacy, teaching, and learning during the COVID-19 crisis. The COVID-19 crisis has been a stark reminder of the gaps that exist between the advantaged and the disadvantaged. Even as we come together as a city to develop COVID response plans, Many of those who benefit from city programs find themselves more marginalized because they lack literacy proficiency. On top of this, in what I would call a cruel twist, much of our response to these communities have been a reliance on remote platforms. And therein lies the rub. In order to access these platforms, Vulnerable communities need expensive technology, such as computers, tablets, and internet service. Moreover, they need to know how to use this technology. Many sadly do not, as a whole lot of New Yorkers do not. As COVID-19 forces us to embrace new pedagogies through remote platforms, Digital literacy has therefore created an even greater divide between those with access and those without. That is just not acceptable. In my remarks last September, I mentioned that throughout history, literacy has been a method of social control and oppression because the ability to read and write determines where people stand within the social hierarchy. Indeed, literacy was weaponized as a way to keep the rich powerful and the poor powerless. In the era of COVID-19, digital literacy may well be doing the same thing. More than ever before during our recent history, we need to provide access to both literacy and digital literacy resources. That means you as agencies have to rethink your approaches to literacy programming and be flexible enough to make sure that your providers and program participants are empowered to adapt to this new normal of COVID-19. 
We have lots of questions for you, but first I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. And again, I wanna say thank you to council member and chair Menchaca for hosting this important hearing. And um, I see we've been joined by council member Chin. And um, I, I think council member Menchaca acknowledged the council members that are here, I think. Um, and uh, I would li also like to thank my staff Issa Cortez, Venori Ranawara, Christian Ravello, and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Anna Zamina, and Michelle Peregrine, along with our community engagement representative, Elizabeth Arts. I will now turn to my co chair, Council Member Menchaca, to kick off some of the procedural items and introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose, and uh, again, thank you for, for that commitment. I, I, I want to also highlight uh, the work the, of the budget negotiation team around adult literacy. Uh, we have the chair of the finance committee here as well, uh, Chair Drum uh, of the finance committee, and really the entire BNT that fought to keep uh, most of the adult literacy money intact. And we're going to talk about that today, and that, that is because of the championship of the members who understand the importance of this. And those hard questions are still gonna to come to the administration about how this is being executed and what we can do uh, to continue that. Uh, we've also been joined by council member Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn. So welcome to you. And I'm gonna hand it over uh, to our committee council Harbani Ahuja to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Ahuja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at, what, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panel will consist of members of the public, followed by members from the administration, followed by libraries, adult literacy providers, advocates, and additional members of the public. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We will now hear testimony from our first panel. I'd like to welcome Lillian Kong to testify. After Lillian, I will be calling on Jonathan Exlad and then Jin Hee Kim to testify. Lillian Kong, you may begin when you are ready. Time yeah. starts now. Mm -hmm. Time starts now. Mike? You may proceed. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, ma'am. You may, you may yeah. begin. Okay. Okay. Let's start. Hello, uh, everyone. My name is Lillian, and I studied the English at the Chinese American Planning Council for one year. I started learning English so that I could become more independent continue my education, find a job, and help with my daughter's education. Today, I want to tell you about my experience learning from home during the COVID-19 outbreak and the importance of English in my life. Before I came to the United States four years ago, I looked forward to the bright future. However, due to my lack of English ability, this dream was soon defeated by reality. 
when I first arrived, I didn't even dare to go shopping and I couldn't get around on the subway alone. I was afraid to communicate with others and I couldn't experience myself. I still haven't found a former job, which is very stressful for me. I am a very independent person, but I have to rely on my husband for financial support. Another reason I want to learn English is to help with my daughter's education. I'm, I'm, all, I'm also worried that I won't be able to have a deep conversation with her in the future. After studying English, I can read stories to her and I chat with her friends at the park. After COVID-19 outbreak, CPC started to have English classes online. I have to take care of my daughters every day, so it's difficult to study English. Still, my classmates and I made a lot of progress in all online classes. Um, CPC also shares information with us about the news, the census, and the COVID-19. So, I am really grateful that the CPC still provides help to new immigrants in such a difficult time. And uh, I am also very grateful to my teacher for doing everything possible to teach us. Because of the coronavirus, I think, life in the United States will be more difficult in the future. Immigrants will be misunderstood or discriminated against if we can't speak English, how can we defend ourselves? We need English to communicate with others and keep ourselves safe. English classes are even more important for immigrants now than they were before the outbreak. I appreciate it. Time expired. Okay. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling on Jonathan Ekblad. You may begin when you are ready. Your time starts now. Hi, I'm Jonathan Ekblad. I'm a teacher and administrator at the University Settlement Adult Literacy Program on the Lower East Side. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today and thank you Lillian for speaking. Um, uh, in our program, uh, our students have faced some similar uh, challenges that Lillian described. Uh, a big challenge is for uh, students who have children at home, who have to help their own children with online learning. And so many of our students have not been able to continue their own online learning uh, in our English classes because they have to help their children. Uh, so, um, and another, another difficulty with our program has been really trying to help those students who struggle with digital literacy, using technology, uh, students whose Wi-Fi or internet bandwidth isn't so strong. And it's very difficult to reach the students who probably you know, need the most help and they're uh, it's, you know, we try to provide one-on-one -on -one help over the phone, but it's very difficult when there's that distance there. Um, I think the other, the other unfortunate effect of COVID has been that um, the sense of community within classes has kind of been lost just because, um, you know, everything's mediated over Zoom or over Google Classroom. And so just kind of private conversations between students and them, you know, relying on each other and giving advice and getting to know each other, that's kind of lost on the, uh, uh, in the online environment. So, um, you know, looking forward, I would guess maybe we'll have a hybrid model of online learning and remote learning, but um, 
it's very difficult just to for us as a program too to gauge the safety and how much you know how much we should in encourage students to start coming in in, per in person classes and we're not um, public health experts so just from an administrative standpoint that's been very difficult to um, consider or make any sort of decision about. And that's, uh, I'm finished talking. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling on Jin Hee Kim to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Oh, hi, my name is Jin Hee Kim and I am working as a uh, like program coordinator uh, with John and at University Settlement. And then also in the evening, I teach in the Bronx Community College. Yeah, uh, like, uh, yeah, I've been teaching like all the time, so I could see the change after the pandemic started. And then I see a lot of like challenges um, that, yeah, that's like a fall on our students. But I'm so, I was so impressed that our students never gave up, even though it's really difficult. Because a lot of students, they um, lost their jobs during the pandemic. So, so we had some students who didn't even have a food to eat, but they didn't stop like learning English, they still came to school like online. And then also after the, uh, you know, in New York City in March and April, it was very serious, but later it got better. And then our students were the first ones who had to go back to work because they have to work as cashiers in the supermarkets or cleaning people in like hospitals or hotels, but they were not ready. Like, you know, a lot of us, you know, they were still afraid, but they still need, needed to make money for their family. So they had to go because if they don't go, they're gonna get fired. So they went there. So a lot of students had to go back to work. And then, so they had to like drop the class or they were like texting me like, oh, teacher, can you wait for me? I'm on my way home. So I can join your class later. I don't wanna cancel. So they were really struggling a lot but they didn't give up. So sometimes it was very like a touchy and then I became very emotional. But um, as like John and John said, we have a lot of also uh, students who are parents. So when they have to learn in the morning, they couldn't because they have to, you know, give their computer or their smartphone to their kids who have to learn. They think their kids are more important than their education. So they are not the priority because kids are important for them, right? And then also a lot of students, they are living in the, uh, the neighborhoods, their internet is not strong. So during my class, I have a lot of students like uh, who kept like going out and then coming back because their internet is not stable. And then, but they, they get so frustrated because of that, but they don't give up. So I really like praise them about that, you know, their strength and then their willingness not to give up. But, you know, as a teacher, I feel so bad because we cannot really support them a lot, especially about the, you know, like a digital devices and then strong internet. So I wish we could do something. I know like for kids, like a K to 12, they like, you know, let out the, what is it? Like a rented, like a tablet or computers, but adult students, we don't have that kind of luxury. Time expired. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling on council members for questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. I see council member Chin has a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, chairs. Um, good morning. Uh, and thank you for the testimony, um, Lillian um, and, and the teachers. I know how committed you know, all of you are. And um, you know, my background is also in education and I ran programs, ESL programs and college programs. I, my question is that, I guess it's really related to a budget question. Is that how do we, you know, 
I, I guess we have to fight for more resources so that the adult student will have the hot spot, hot spot, whatever, and the tablet, so that they don't have to fight with, you know, the children to get it. Uh, so I think that's something that we have to uh, commit to, and also in the funding that we have fought for, that there should be allocation for equipments uh, for the student, just like um, we did for the Department, you know, of Education for our, our children. It's not perfect, you know. It's not. There's still a lot we got to do. Same thing with our seniors. You know, the, the city gave out tablets to seniors, but not all seniors got it. And a lot of them don't really know how to use it. And going, you know, in the future for seniors who go to senior center who want to participate in program, that's going to be the future. They would have to also learn how to use uh, the computer tablet to participate. So I think that's something that we really need to look at having the resources uh, to assist, um, you know, student to learn and seniors and, and um, you know, ESL student. Um, the question I have is that, have the provider thought about using other forms of, um, you know, more flexible, whether, um, you know, recording the, the classes, uh, whether it's on YouTube or I don't know what other platform, uh, so that the student can access it later. Like they, if they can't participate in the class because they have to work, but they can sign on later uh, to be able to still, you know, get the lessons um, that was taught that day. So if there are ways that we can help to work with the provider to see if there are other creative ways to provide the lessons and the participation uh, whether it's also group learning among the students themselves. I don't know, I'm not tech savvy. Like with Zoom, you know, you have meeting rooms and how do you separate out? So I think that's something that going, you know, towards the future, we really got to find ways to make it more flexible so that people can, you know, learn and participate and, and be involved um, in that. And I hope that, you know, the administration, uh, DYCD and, and uh, to really look at innovative program that can help our those students uh, take advantage of learning um, ESL, you know, so it doesn't have to be you have to physically go to a class at nine o'clock, but you might be able to sign on to the class in the evening and be able to participate while your kid is sleeping and you have some time, you can do that. So that's what I, you know, that that's something that I think going forward hopefully working together with the providers and the administration, we could find some creative ways uh, of providing these classes that are so vital. And that's why it's so frustrating when we were fighting, right, Carlos, during the budget time that the administration, you know, they oh, always yeah. cut the funding. I say, this is a no brainer that parents yeah. and, you know, immigrant adult wants to learn English because that's the only way that they know that they can, you know, help their student, you know, help their kids and get a better job is a no brainer. And we need to invest money in that. And every year we have to fight the administration and the council has to put the money back in. Um, so we just hope that we can really make a change to, to really have a, a better future in terms of how everyone will have the benefit of learning, you know, from young students all the way to our seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'd like to now turn it to Council Member Mintaka. Thank you. Uh, and if there are no questions, I just want to say thank you to this public panel. Uh, that's the tradition in, in the Immigration Committee, really to hear from people on the ground that are experiencing the issues and allowing that to frame the discussion that we heard from teachers and uh, Lillian who is at home and wants to learn. And I think that all of these issues we're gonna explore with the administration and the CBOs. And so I just wanna say thank you to the panel for being here, for speaking your truth. And, uh, and everything that Council Member Chin said is not only right on, that's gonna be the struggle as we get towards the next budget. Thank you. Council Member Rose. Yes, um, I, I'm just really concerned. Um, Council Member Chin, you know, talked about uh, 
you know, people being able to log on in the evening at nine o'clock. I'm just wondering about whether or not um, the clients have been able to join the classes with the technology that they already have, or um, is are there a need? Is there a need for specific technology um, to be made available to them so that they can engage, uh, especially in light of you know the distance learning um, through COVID? Um, I guess Jonathan. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, what Council Member Chin uh, uh, mentioned, hotspots would be nice, where it's a more stable internet connection. Um, just about everybody has smartphones these days, but they're not ideal for some of the activities and some of the things we do. So, you know, ideally a laptop, a laptop and a hotspot. I think that would be perfect. And just to address what uh, Council Member Chen also mentioned, we do, our program does have, we have different schedules. So we try and fit people's, you know, uh, personal ava availability, but we do, you know, we use Google Classroom. So most of the activities and assignments and everything are right there and students can ask the teacher questions and everything. So there is a, you know, if a student can't get online or is very busy or something, they, they are able to later go back and kind of catch up. It's not quite the same thing as being in the class and interacting with classmates, but there is that capability there too. Do you find that they have access to the technology that they need to do that to participate? Is there a need for more resources and, and how, how do they access that technology if they don't have it, you know, personally? Um, uh, uh, you know, I think, um, oh, can you, can, can you rephrase the question oh, a little okay. bit? Yeah. Um, um, do you do, um, are, are the programs providing technology for um, for students who want to participate in um, in your programs? I don't know about other programs, but uh, we have not been providing any technology. We just have to work with what the students have. First of all, you know, there's a question of, you know, we we really don't want them coming in. We're, we're, our organization has many different programs and everything. So we really didn't want them coming in to like pick things up. And we, as far as I know, our budget just would, doesn't allow, you know, doesn't allow for that kind of big expenditure on technology, you know, in giving it out to students. Jonathan, my question isn't, um, you know, to put you on the spot. I I'm just trying to um, just uh, figure out, you know, if uh, access to technology is a problem for, um, for, you know, ESL learners, le learners who want to participate in these programs, if access to technology is, is not, you know, available, then that's an additional barrier that you know, we have to um, try to figure out how to address. That's all. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think a hotspot and a laptop for every student that needs it would be perfect. I don't know if anybody else has any other teachers or <laughs> if anybody else has any ideas about that. Thank you, Jonathan, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling um, on representatives from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to testify. Uh, Moya testimony will be provided by Moya Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives and IDNYC, Colette Salmon. Additionally, Executive Director of Programs, Alexandra Ruiz will be available for answering questions. After Moya testifies, I will be calling on representatives from the Department of Youth and Community Development to testify. 
DYCD testimony will be provided by DYCD Assistant Commissioner of Literacy and Immigrant Initiatives, Rong Zhang. As a reminder during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Deputy Commissioner Colette Salmon, Executive Director Alexandra Ruiz, and Assistant Commissioner Rong Zhang. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Salmon? Yes. Thank you. Executive Director Alexandra Ruiz? Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Rong Zhang? Yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Salmon, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Um, thank you to Chairman Chaka, Chair Rose, and the members of the Committee on Immigration and Youth Services. My name is Colette Mann. I am the Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Programs and IDMYC at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Moya and the city as a whole have long recognized that literacy is crucial for the realization of individual and individuals full potential as well as their increased social, economic and political empowerment. Students have also shown a positive intergenerational spillover from adult literacy, which can improve parents access to information and resources they need to invest in their child's development and education. New York City is one of the most linguistically diverse cities in the world. More than 200 languages are spoken by residents across the five boroughs. This diversity comes with challenges. We know that many New Yorkers have limited English proficiency, especially immigrant New Yorkers. Almost half of all immigrant New Yorkers and about 60% of undocumented New Yorkers have LEP. Moreover, almost a quarter of all immigrant New Yorkers and 32% of immigrant, undocumented immigrant New Yorkers do not have a high school diploma compared to 10% of US born New Yorkers. For this reason, Moya and our agency partners are deeply invested in providing access to adult literacy programs for New Yorkers. Today's testimony focuses on Moya's We Speak New York City program and the shifts Moya has made to adjust to the COVID-19 pandemic. Moya plays an important role in the adult literacy field through our We Speak New York City program. We Speak New York City is different from other ASOL programming because it serves both learners and educators with materials that speak directly to city services and how to access them. Through We Speak, Moya coordinates a set of volunteer-led English conversation classes that uses episodes of the Emmy Award-winning We Speak NYC television show and other materials over the course of seven to 10 weeks. The classes address common issues and challenges encountered by immigrants and help students learn about available city services, as well as resources that are relevant to their lives. Students can also engage with independent study tools for each episode. These materials also support the educators. Moya has a strong collaborative relationship with adult literacy service providers in New York City and provides We Speak multimedia curriculum for free. The curriculum includes videos, lesson plans, student activities, study guides, and more for providers of ESOL and other adult literacy classes across the city. These materials are highly adaptable for learners with different goals and proficiency levels and have been widely utilized in a variety of education settings. We Speak NYC is an important and effective program that makes a significant contribution to the city's adult literacy landscape. Moreover, at a time when students are struggling with job and income loss, among other challenges, access to help learning English is more necessary than ever. 88% of We Speak New York City providers we surveyed said pandemic related challenges have been exacerbated for students who have limited reading, writing, English language and or digital literacy skills. For that reason, when the world changed because of COVID-19, We Speak NYC quickly changed its gear to ensure educa education could continue without a significant interruption. This was not without challenges. More than two thirds of We Speak New York City providers we surveyed have said that the shift to remote teaching required them to provide new training to educators and staff on digital education. And about half of our providers noted that they had to adapt to using new technology to meet the needs of their students. 
Despite hurdles, we managed to transition our program into a remote model in just two weeks, delivering all programmatic activities and services online. This includes continuing our volunteer-led classes in a new format with weekly online conversation classes that covered COVID-19 themes and resources available to immigrant New Yorkers. We have also conducted Know Your Rights presentations, emailed resources to our students, and provided weekly student packets for We Speak NYC conversation classes to students with information on NYC services and other educational materials. Moya continues to promote We Speak NYC through outreach to different community-based organizations, as well as collaboration with other organizations. This includes a recently launched online promotional campaign in partnership with CUNY schools, libraries, and CBOs. As we have transitioned into this new all digital world, we have noticed some trends. Adult learners who already have reliable technology and internet access have gained new benefits from remote learning, including the ability to limit travel and childcare needs, participate in classes at a wider range of time, and attend classes even if they are ill or less mobile. Students and teachers have also been gaining digital literacy skills while engaging with contact online. While we recognize that students have uneven access to information and communication technologies. We Speak NYC is continuously working to address these issues and plans and to continue operating classes and workshops for educators remotely. In the weeks ahead, we will be surveying our partner sites to better understand their reopening plans and how they may affect service delivery. Adult literacy programs have risen to the challenges of, these pan of this pandemic, quickly adapting their instructions to remote platforms like Zoom, Google Classroom, WhatsApp and providing additional one on one support to their students. However, these providers, including our We Speak New York City partners, still face enormous challenges. Many students are facing job loss, housing insecurity, childcare burden, and health issues, and such hardship makes it difficult for them to prioritize education. Moya has developed a comprehensive immigrant resource guide for new immigrant New Yorkers seeking assistance, and this information is shared with our We Speak NYC program participants. Moya and our partners have successfully brainstormed and collaborating on addressing many of these challenges and remain committed to finding ways to help our learners, providers, and community partners in this difficult time. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Rong Zhang. You may begin when you are ready. Good morning, Chair Rose, Chair Menchaka, and members of the Youth Services and Immigration Committees. I'm Rang Zhan, Assistant Commissioner for Literacy and Immigrant Initiatives at the Department of Youth and Community Development. On behalf of DYCD Commissioner Bill Chang, thank you for the opportunity for comment. For, for, so thank you for the uh, opportunity to comment on DYCD's adult literacy services. The ability to read and write is fundamental to a person's capacity to succeed in life. English proficiency is associated with the ability to find and keep employment that pays a living wage and provides opportunities for upward advancement. Helps parents fully support and participate in their child's education and actively engage in civic life. The most recent census data for New York City show that there are 1.76 million or 22.4% of the individuals aged five years and over who speak English less than very well and 544,714 or 9.1% of persons aged 25 years and over who have less than a ninth grade education. These data point toward a high need for ESOL instruction and adult basic education classes. In neighborhoods with large, low-income immigrant populations, the need is particularly high. For example, Queens Community Districts 3 and 7, that is Jackson Heights and Flushing, and Brooklyn Community District 11, Bensonhurst, have the highest populations of persons who speak English less than very well, and Manhattan Community District 12 it's Washington Heights, Inwood area, Queens 3, Jackson Heights, and Brooklyn 7, Sunset Park, 
have the highest populations of persons who have less than ninth grade education. These findings are supported by DYCD's comprehensive community needs assessment survey, a survey that collected information from residents who were asked among other questions to identify the service gaps in their community. In New York City overall, survey residents ranked English classes as the number two service gap from a listing of 28 items. In 10 communities, residents ranked English classes as their number one service gap. Six communities ranked adult education literacy instruction as among the top five service gaps. We thank the council for its strong long-standing partnership on adult literacy programs. It has been critical to funding programs across the city. UICD commits $15 million to support adult literacy programs from a mix of federal community services block grant, CSBG and a community development block grant, CDBG funding and city tax levy funding. This work is complemented by other literacy programs supported by the Department of Education, the City University of New York and the public library systems. DYCD's adult literacy programs include a variety of courses to meet the various needs of participants. For example, these adult literacy programs offer adult basic education that teaches both native and non-native English speakers reading, writing, and math. We offer high school equivalency prep classes to prepare students for the test assessment secondary completion, known as TASC. ESOL civics classes and English for speakers of other language classes teach listening, speaking, reading, and writing to indiv individuals whose primary language is not English. In fiscal year 2020, our adult literacy programs enrolled 15,631 participants. Students not only benefit academically by participating in our literacy programs, they also receive other much needed assistance such as referral to employment training, college assistance and individual support. To assist in career and college exploration with participants, DYCD has partnered with CUNY to train our instructors, counselors, case managers on their uh, career kids curriculum. The participants learn how to meet literacy goals while si simultaneously learning about careers, incorporating career content into reading, writing, math, and research activities. Learning about CUNY admission procedures, college prep programs, and financial aid systems. To further promote the use of technology in the classrooms, our technical assistance provider, the Literacy Assistance Center, offered training on Google's Applied Digital Skills Curriculum. This online site with ready-to-use video lessons teach digital skills that have immediate real-life application. CVO staff learn the basics of Google Drive, focusing on why it is useful for adult education and explore the Google's Applied Digital Skills lessons. We have partnered with Moya to discuss ways to promote We Speak NYC, a video series produced by Moya and CUNY to help English language learners improve their language skills while learning about city services and their rights. Moya staff presented We Speak NYC to literacy providers. A joint professional training session on best practices around integration of the video, video into English language classes has been offered to providers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, adult literacy programs quickly transitioned into the realm of distance learning. We are grateful to the literacy providers for their tremendous effort during this challenging time period. And we thank them for their commitment and flexibility. Both teachers and students were required to adjust to new online learning and teaching platforms such as Zoom and Google Classroom. In order to facilitate the transition, DYCD staff in concert with our technical assistance provider provided timely training 
to CBO staff on effective use of various online platforms to engage students. PYCD also organized several meetings where providers discussed successes and challenges of remote learning, which offered them the opportunity to exchange ideas and to share best practices and resources. Programs have quickly adapted their instruction to remote platform and provided additional one-on-one -on -one support to their students through phone calls, text messages, online platforms, email, and expanded support services. Programs are supporting students to continue their learning, stay connected to a caring community, and access essential information and services. Although the pandemic has brought new challenges to our students and programs, requiring them to adapt to a new way of learning, DYCD maintains our commitment to adult learners. We have received positive feedback about the use of remote learning tools in adult literacy programs. Some providers have reported that some students who were previously increased their participation when classes moved online. We have also seen that some families found it easier to fit the classes into their schedules when they were able to join programs from their homes. <clears throat> we will continue to work with our providers to best accommodate the learning needs of our students. Once again, thank you for holding this hearing today. We look forward to continuing to work with the City Council on promoting adult literacy. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka, followed by Chair Rose. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chairman Chaka, please begin. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanna start with one question and then uh, let Chair Rose uh, have questions and then members and then come back and do a deeper dive. And I really wanna say uh, first, thank you to the administration, DYCD, in the mayor's office, uh, we partnered in a very strong way to uh, commit funding in this last really difficult fiscal year. And that totaled to about $9.8 million for adult literacy as an initiative. Uh, 6.4 of that was on the mayor's side for funding. And I believe that there was an increase in slots actually at the mayor's side for, for literacy. And so I just, I just want to make sure that we can we can get from you all the, the breakdown of that because it's an important thing to, to say thank you. Uh, when the administration you know steps up and, and does does the right thing, we want to say thank you to that. Um, and I think it's going to set us up for larger discussions about how we think about resources. And we we believe that there were more slots at the end of the day in this last fiscal year than previous years from the administration. And we'd like to know if those were already allocated and if other members of the community are still able to kind of access those funds that were, uh, that were allocated for slots. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused by your question. Are you asking what our budgeted amount was? Are you asking about the lit funding? I'm... Okay, so let me just put it straight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we want to fund classes, students yep. in classes. That's what we want. We saw that the administration funded more seats. Can you confirm that so we can say thank you? Um, I think it's a, okay. That's, let me see if I can answer your question and if it's satisfactory. If not, Alex, if you wanna tag on as well to um, answer this. So, Yes, we received funding um, and we have done our best to um, make sure that we are everywhere and anywhere we co possibly could be. Prior to COVID-19, um, we were, uh, you know, rocking and rolling in all places, 75 sites across the city. We had uh, really high participation and average between 3,000 to 3,500 learners a year. That does not include the people because we did a huge digital upgrade um, last summer 
to our website, which then made it much more interactive and people globally could access our website, take the quizzes, do different things. They were not, they could watch the episodes. They were not receiving live instruction, but they were certainly able to do a lot more than they were by just, you know, watching an episode and then potentially not having any backup curriculum. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Julie, Commissioner, can I pause you there? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure. talking about We Speak. Uh, we Speak is not a classroom. Uh, oh, so it's for DYCD. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about the seats and the allocation yep. of funding towards those seats. Okay. Uh, and if we have DYCD confirm those 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 numbers, I think it's something right. to celebrate right now. Go on. Uh, first of all, let me uh, begin by thanking the council for your support, uh, especially at this time. Um, you know, we're a very a, a whole adult literacy community and DYCD are very grateful that um, given the current situation, we not only kept our base contracts funding intact, we got additional funds, um, which we, it's known as expansion funds. Um, we, yes, we have already allocated those funds. We got the uh, go ahead to start contract amend pro amendment process. And we are expanding programs by serving an additional 5,000 students within our base contracts. Um, and also there is about 40 some programs uh, designated through the city council. And there is an additional two to 3,000 people that is gonna be served. Um, this all together, you know, we're talking about seven, 8,000 people to be served under the additional funds. Okay, thank you. I just want to say again, thank you. I think that's good news. And that I think is going to really build a, a base of discussion as we move forward to the next budget discussions. Uh, I'll hand it over to Chair Rose. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Um, uh, Assistant Commissioner Zhang, um, in fiscal 2020 mayor's management report, DYCD reported steady growth in the number of participants in DYCD funded English literacy programs since, since FY 2016. In fact, by FY 20, the number of participants had doubled, it, uh, doubled to 15,631 from 7,582 in fiscal year 16. Um, do these numbers reflect unique participants? Um, and there and has the and, and there is no target enrollment listed for FY21. With the FY21 increased investment in adult literacy classes, does DYCD expect a further increase of program enrollees in fiscal year 21? Well, if FY21, we uh, based on what I have right now, we have we anticipate to serve about thirteen thousand students. Um, thirteen thousand students um, this year. I believe um, the number has come down a little bit compared to the previous year uh, because the 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 forty some awards from the council funded uh, side. Um, had a across the board 15% uh, reduction as I understand. Um, so, you know, based on our estimate, so the, the numbers will come down um, accordingly. How does the growth in the student enrollment over the last four fiscal years relate to the waiting lists um, that were held by adult literacy providers and have those lists been depleted do they remain stable or are they continuing to grow? I believe that, you know, there is, you know, there's always people that are on the waiting list or waiting to get into those programs. You know, the need is always there. You know, the, the services the you know, the service that's been provided obviously are not meeting the huge demands uh, out there. Uh, but, um, you know, DYCD, uh, in collaboration with our partners, other literacy providing entities, and the council 
you know, we've been doing our best, you know, to expand our programs to provide services to, to more people. But this has always to do with the availability of funds and also, you know, the provider's capacity. So, <clears throat> given, um, given the fiscal forecast, um, will the city continue to be flexible with the contract reimbursements? Um, and if the work, you know, goes beyond the original plan and uh, costs exceed expectations, will, um, will DYCD be flexible? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Flexibility has been something, you know, um, that we, we are aware, aware of and we emphasize a lot during these difficult times. And, uh, you know, we work within, you know, of course, we work within our budgets. Uh, CBOs work within their budgets, uh, but we are flexible in terms of how they spend the money. For example, during the um, pandemic, CBOs needed to, you know, purchase tablets, uh, laptops, whatever equipment needed to help students access services. And they propose this and we give them special consideration. In normal times, we would be more uh, careful with those, but during these times, we, you know, give them, you know, permission uh, to, to do this. Um, and I just give, to give you an example, under our CDBG, the federal fund um, uh, funded programs, and the equipment usually under that funding source is sort of limited. Uh, but given the current situation, you know, equipment purchase under that has been loosened and we, you know, give them special dispensation to buy those equipment uh, to continue, you know, learning and services. Um, especially during COVID-19, it's really critical that um, this already underserved population has access to the technology that they need to uh, continue to, um, with their literacy programming. So, um, I'm glad to hear that there is some flexibility. Uh, the need is great. And so I just wanna make sure that we are, you know, um, not putting any or, or complicating any of the barriers that, you know, they already face. We're, we're talking about, um, you know, people who have been all traditionally underserved and, um, and have, you know, suffered systemic disparities. So um, I'm glad to hear that we're, we're working on that. And, and one of the um, issues that uh, we've discussed, you know, um, frequently with DYCD is, um, is the portal and, and access to information. So um, does DYCD assist contracting organizations with advertising adult literacy programming? And if so, um, you know, how are you doing that? And um, if not, you know, why? Um, and then I wanna know the Discover DYCD portal provides information about DYCD contracted providers, but what other information about these programs exists for individuals with low digital literacy? Um, DYCD certainly helps, you know, uh, with the, you know, uh, dissemination of program information, uh, you know, giving people necessary information to access our programs in all the communities. Uh, our website, you know, has all program areas, what they do, and the list of providers, contact information. Discover DYCD has been you know, updated again and again, and uh, there is necessary information for uh, for people and the language we use in there are, you know, plain language, for, you know, for English speakers, and also um, people uh, programs are already using the system to apply uh, to to submit applications online. So that is a big help in in this process, uh, during this time. Um, DYCD's Youth Connect um, is a popular hotline. 
Um, it's out there. People always call and, and, and about literacy programs and uh, they always pass on information um, uh, through that uh, venue. Um, and also, you know, uh, 311 has our information uh, too. So there are various ways people can get information through the city uh, about the services out there. But what I will say is that really, it's really the, our providers of programs that promote their programs. And they are in the communities, they are using whatever they think would, you know, would best, would be easily accessible and best accessible for their participants. For example, some of them use local TV, use local newspapers, different languages. Uh, you know, nowadays, especially you know, now, they, are, they turn to social media uh, using Facebook and <clears throat> to uh, uh, advertise, promote their programs. And as I understand that, um, they're actually doing a great job uh, reaching out to people, um, especially um, you know, after the first few months uh, uh, following March. Does Discover DYCD um, though advertise beyond um, the city websites? Because um, how do individuals know to look for this portal um, to find you know, uh, DYCD contracted programs? Well, um, DYCD contracts with what about Three so has three about probably three thousand contracts, and the services are, are provided throughout the communities in the city. Um, you know, programs all know about uh, Discover DYCD, and they are expected to use that uh, to um, process uh, applications. Uh, in addition to um, you know, um, uh, walk-ins in the uh, continuing the, yeah, the, the um, way. Assistant Commissioner, I'm I'm talking about you know how does Discover DYCD advertise beyond city websites, um, or do you? Um, I need to find out about how that's done and if it's done. Um, can, we can get back to you on that. Yeah, because if someone's unaware of that portal, then, you know, um, it, it, it's sort of a moot point uh, about how they access, you know, these programs, uh, these, you know, DYCD uh, contracted programs. Um, I, um, I have just one more question before I, uh, I turn over, um, but I, I wanted to know what types of evaluations of adult literacy programs program contracts does DYCD conduct? And um, would you share them uh, with the committee? You mean evaluation of contracts? Yes, of the adult literacy contracts. Okay, um, you know, we're a contracting agency. Um, we, as you know, that we conduct, you know, program reviews or site visits um, all the time. Um, during those um, visits, you know, we have conversations with uh, CBO program staff, program directors, teachers, and participants. And we make sure that they comply with contract expectations. They provide services as uh, expected. Um, and we also have in all programs, class schedules. So we observe classrooms um, you know, uh, exchange ideas with uh, staff and uh, if necessary, provide support and uh, staff training. And we work with our TA provider very closely in that respect. And our TA provider, as you all know, the Literacy Assistance Center, uh, work with programs very closely uh, providing services. They also do on-site uh, support. Uh, um, and we, of course, uh, you know, following each visit, each re program review, CBOs receive a report from us, um, you know, detailing our findings, um, in, in, you know, encouraging continue, continued strengths and uh, working on weaknesses through support and uh, 
TA. Um, and of course, there is an annual uh, program evaluation, which is, um, you know, used to be called um, um, Vendex evaluation. So that basically looks at, you know, service level, you know, administration, fiscal integrity, and all that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's programs are monitored okay. closely. And, um I would just ask if uh, if the committee, if the uh, Youth Services Committee, could get copies of those uh, those reports. You mean site visit reports? Yes. Certainly, we can we can share uh, some of the site visit reports. We can get some samples for you. Uh, the, well, you, those are the evaluation reports of of the sites. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, thank you, Chairman Chaka. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, I'll now turn it over to Council Member Chin for questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my first, <coughs> my first question is to uh, DYCD, um, Deputy Commissioner. Um, you know, during the COVID, I'm just comparing in terms of what, because I chair the Committee on Aging, and there's like, you know, over, you know, 249 senior centers. So when Council Member Chair Rose asked about flexibility, uh, I wanted to know, like, did DYCD in the beginning uh, send out a notice to all the providers asking them or giving them guidance in terms of, you know, turning from a you know, um, in classroom setting to remote learning, um, you know, how to go about that, the requirement, and also were there like uh, guidance given into like if there are needs for equipment uh, for their students, how, you know, how can they use some of their budget? So were that information provided in the beginning uh, to help them transition? from in-person uh, learning to remote learning? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, as the um, uh, virus situation got uh, worsened back in early March, we already anticipated that, you know, the closing of the programs, uh, you know, are, might happen. So in our, you know, last in-person providers meeting uh, in early March, um, we specifically devoted the, almost the whole meeting just to discuss how we can, you know, transition to, a, you know, continued on, to, to online services, to, to online instruction to continue services. Uh, there was a lot of discussion. As I mentioned in my testimony, um, you know, DYCD has always uh, placed priority and emphasis on integrating technology into classrooms. Back in the beginning of fiscal uh, 20, um, through LAC, we worked with Google and we got a pilot program going to actually teach people how to use Google Drive, Google Classrooms, uh, to you know, uh, assist the the, the in-person classes. So um, in in that pilot, I if I remember correctly, you know there were four series of training. Um, Sixty people from close to twenty, a little over twenty programs actually participated in that summer. Um, so that really prepared you know uh, our programs. Um, for that concept of online teaching. And, um, you know, as we actually was just about to work with, continue to work with Google to expand that, you know, um, pandemic struck and that we got, just, you know, sidetracked on that. But, you know, programs really, uh, I really here would have to uh, um, give a uh, you know, shout to our programs. They, and participant staff who really made um, efforts did a quick transition uh, to uh, distance learning 
and remote services. Um, DYCD from the get-go provided guidance in terms of continued uh, budgeting, continued contracting, and continued programming. Our chief of staff was our designated point person for COVID issues. And I remember just, you know, within the first week of the closure, we had our first uh, providers meeting on WebEx. Our um, chief of staff was there to talk with, to, to, you know, to basically in, explain, uh, you know, the city's general guidelines on continued services and keeping, making sure that CBO's uh, contract are intact. In, in there was no layoff, there was no closing of programs. Um, you, know, uh, you, you, you know, there is continued funding. Um, we gave guidance to programs in terms of instruction under the new circumstances. Um, you know, for example, um, we had to, you know, waive certain requirements to ensure services are continued. One of the things was, as you all know, we administer standardized testing for literacy programs to, for placement and uh, progress measurement. Um, and uh, that test was administered uh, in person. But we, you know, given the situation, we, we couldn't do that. And we had to, you know, waive that like, you know, other literacy pro providers uh, to waive that and, and to give CBOs guidance that they should, you know, do their best to assess their students however they can and making sure the students are still placed um, pro properly to receive services. And that's what the CBOs did. And we continue to give them guidance throughout the, 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 the time. Uh, in May, we gave them guidance um, on summertime. Um, you know, summertime was a, a very good time for programs to um, sort of relax a little bit, focus on, you know, staff development training to get ready for the full programming. And, um, you know, we do have programs that still continue summer programming uh, and the services, but there was a lot of staff development training uh, given to them. Um, just DYCD, we convened at least four um, best practice sharing. We call it a teacher share. You know, providers actually um, served as panelists on those shared what they did during the last six months in terms of using different platforms to uh, effectively engage students. The LAC, our TA provider, worked with providers closely too, um, providing um, TA services online um, as, a, as groups and also individually to programs. So um, our programs have expressed a lot of uh, gratitude to our continued support, to LAC's continued support. That, that's very good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, can you also tell me, like, I know you gave an example about the flexibility of providers using certain funding to, to buy equipment. How many of that requests came in or did you also uh, let the provider know that the flexibility is available, that if their student needs equipment to continue uh, the learning that they can use some of the, the funding um, to do that? Um, yes, I mean, you know, um, we know um, how hard it was and, uh, and we never really have enough money uh, to, you know, uh, distribute devices you know, like other entities you know, to our programs. But we certainly, you know, working within our budgets, we, we allowed the flexibility and we let CPCBOs know that they can certainly uh, buy equipment um, for students, for staff to continue services. Um, we, um, um, we, uh, we actually, when, when and we also ask them, of course, we ask them to indicate that is, that is COVID-19 related. So then we can expedite our 
uh, review and uh, approval process uh, working with our fiscal office. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for the uh, Deputy Commissioner Pamoya. Um, I think that in your, um, in your testimony, we hear about you know, all these different uh, entity that provides uh, English language classes, but DOE, CUNY, the library, um, all the providers from um, DYCD. Is Moya the agency that do the coordination or who's in the mayor's office that actually, uh, in the administration that actually have a, a, a comprehensive picture of, uh, of all the fundings and all the, the services that are being offered um, to immigrant uh, population, to adult learner, you know, that we have all these programs available. Like, is there any kind of, you know, coordination to know how many people we're serving? Like the library, who do they report to when they do English classes? Mm -hmm. um, so I can get back to you on who exactly is in charge of the whole citywide um, uh, coordination and collection of data. Moya is in the conversation of adult literacy, not so much, um, not as much as DYCD. So we oversee, we speak. Um, and in my testimony, I spoke about how we partner with different organizations in a variety of ways. So via we speak, um, we are we handle all of the coordination with the CBOs um, and with the libraries where we speak classes are being conducted. We also train all of the volunteers on how to um, run a we speak course as and um, facilitate our curriculum. Um, my internet bandwidth is saying it's low. Can you guys still hear me? Just a thumbs up. Am I good? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. My internet seems to be going. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the that's the we speak piece. In addition to that, we coordinate with CUNY a lot. CUNY, um, you know, has expertise in ESO, ESOL curriculum. And wow. they assist us a lot in the video production. So we work with them there. Um, we also do a lot of support to our partner agencies that Alex can speak to in a moment. Um, we are um, involved in a new pilot project with New Women New York, um, which directs we've tailored our curriculum to directly um, mm. impact workforce development, uh, what the evaluation and outcomes look like. And that's something new for us, but we're very excited, uh, very specific to um, workforce and allowing these women to um, build their uh, literacy skills and how that improves job uh, attainment. Um, Alex, would you want to speak a little bit more to uh, potentially what the the over the bird's eye view is? Yeah, thank you, Colette. So just to echo what Colette was saying, so vis-a-vis -vis the support that we provide, which is through our curriculum, um, we work with community-based organizations, we work with libraries, we work with universities, uh, and we provide their educators with curriculum that covers city services. Um, and coupled with that, we also offer in-person classes and we do that by training volunteers that are placed at different CBO sites. Um, and so that's the, the core uh, service of We Speak NYC. We partner closely with CUNY to ensure that our content is covering materials and topics that are relevant. Most recently, we partnered with the Department of Health, for example, where we created materials on lead. Our entire remote curriculum has been on COVID-19, which I think is a testament to the evergreen uh, content that we've created and the investment that has been made in the website, as well as the second season of We Speak NYC, which covers topics like food security, workforce development, education, et cetera. Thank you. I mean, like there are a lot of, I mean, from your testimony, there are a lot of information out there. And I think, you know, Chair Rose asked about, you know, like getting into information so that people will know about it. I don't think everybody knows about it. I don't think even I know all the programming that you, that you talk about. 
And that's what the question that I was asking in terms of some overall coordination from the administration. I know, you know, whether there is a deputy mayor, you know, that kind of have a oversight of all this. And that would really help kind of put more emphasis on the importance uh, of ESOL, you know, learning, adult learners, and so that pulling all the, the resources together versus, you know, there, there are so many different programs operating out there. And it just kind of like sends a signal that this is an important, you know, population that the city really have to pay attention to. And I think that that's what, you know, we want to see, you know, more coordination, you know, and more kind of a comprehensive review so that when we advocate for funding in the budget, it should not be so difficult to get the administration to provide the funding every year, um, you know, for these classes for our ESOL learners. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. I'm now going to turn it back to Chairman Chaka for further questions. Uh, thank you, Harbani. And I uh, want to start with, with actually a follow up to Council Member Chin's question about, about these services. And uh, a lot of what the Council Adult Literacy Initiative is about is funding classroom experiences. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Asaman, can you talk a little bit about whether or not We Speak is accredited as a, an educational experience that moves people through a uh, like an adult literacy education program? We are not accredited. We are a um, volunteer-led um, curriculum. We have. Um, you know, worked with CUNY and their ESOL department to develop our curriculum. Um, so, uh, you know, and our model relies on the fact that we um, are in the community and that we do things a little bit different to really meet the needs of all kinds of community members. Um, it's not a traditional classroom. Uh, it is held in a very, a very variety of spaces with a variety of ages. Um, However, we have uh, outstanding numbers and we have um, won Emmys. So we feel good about what we're doing. Alex, anything else to add on accreditation? That... You're on mute. Yeah, yeah, thank I'm you. Still muted. Yeah, thank good, you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I would just add, uh, you know, we speak as supplemental. I think one of the things that this particular hearing started with is with the acknowledgement that uh, there's huge waiting list. So we speak provides an opportunity for students to be able to practice their English outside of the traditional classroom setting. So we work closely with organizations that are accredited. We provide additional opportunities to practice and we also help build the capacity of organizations who can't provide that additional time by placing volunteers and providing curricula that covers really important issues that immigrant uh, communities need to be aware of. Th thank you for that. And I appreciate the difference. I think it's an important part, part of the conversation. Uh, I will say that uh, what, what we'd rather do is put more funding in addressing the waiting list than um, than something else. And I think that that's the, that's the push and the policy of the council. And, and I think that's gonna be important as we talk about budget, as we move forward into the budget season. Um, there's a lot of excitement for We Speak and I, and I get that. What, what I wanna know, what Moya is doing to really connect community members, immigrants, people who engage Moya on multiple levels for different reasons to participate in adult literacy accredited classes. What are you doing to crowd build for those? Yeah, I, I just wanna say that, um, you know, I think we speak as multifaceted and I wanna acknowledge that creating curriculum for educators that covers critical services is extremely important. As a former executive director of a nonprofit that focused on ESOL, I know how challenging it is to find high quality free ESOL content. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and uh, to your question, um, I'll just say that more than ever, we have seen how critical it has been to have a website that provides self-guided learning at a time where there isn't 
uh, where there isn't classroom space. So even in the first quarter of fiscal 21, we have seen double the use of our website because people are hungry for content that is not being offered in classroom spaces. So while I acknowledge that absolutely credentialed programs are critical, I don't want to dismiss or diminish the impact that we speak is having vis-a-vis -vis offering tools to the field, as well as providing really important support for CBOs. I, and I get that too. I, I guess what, what, what we're trying to do in this adult literacy conversation is understand the, the need for more adult literacy uh, space. And when we are uh, in a budget crunch, we got to make decisions about where we place funding. And I think we, we did a great job this year to do that. And, and this is not to diminish anything that's coming out of, out of We Speak, but adult literacy class space is where we want to get people to. And, and I think that's what I'm asking Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, what they're doing to push people to accredited classes. And I haven't heard that you're doing anything about that. Yeah. I needed to be unmuted. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, we're continuously uh, working with yeah, we're we're continuously working with partners across the administration to both build out more literacy. Obviously, we would love more literacy funding. We would love to see um, more people be able to access free um, education uh, and as well as uh, ESOL classes. So. Um, as an office, we are not necessarily pushing an accreditation agenda, but we are certainly pushing um, adult literacy, how important it is, um, partnering wherever we can, working uh, with the CT. And, and you know, another thing to recognize is that we're also trying to leverage our position to work with um, varying offices around the city to see how we can help bridge the digital divide, making sure people can access what is out there, right, already. So um, that's a big component too. And I'll just add that uh, we speak tends to be a pipeline for entering other accredited programs. So again, as I mentioned, many students who can't access classes enter we speak. They learn about different accredited accredited programs, including CUNY's program, um, and therefore are introduced uh, to those programs vis-a-vis -vis their first engagement with we speak. Okay. Um this is very concerning. We're going to move on to more questions, but I, I don't see a lot of a plug-in to adult, liter adult literacy accredited classes. I think that's been a long time pro problem. I think there's a lot of focus on We Speak. I think we got to fix that. And I want to, I want to work with you to try to figure out how to do that. I hope you can stay to hear from the CBOs who I think are going to offer some ideas on how to make that happen. But that's, that's the goal. We want people to go into school accredited experiences so that they can move up in their proficiency and be able to get that high school equivalency. That, that, is, the, that is a lot of times the goal. Uh, so so I, let's I, move I, to the next question. Well, I would just let's like move. to say one last thing on that. I appreciate that. And I think we're in agreement that that is important, but Moya as, as an office oversees a supplemental program that leads people to that, that gives people maybe their first step at that, right? And so there, there is an importance and a value to a gateway as well. By all means, we agree that people should be moved into formal education, go, go to an accredited school. We're also, I think what Alex keeps going back to is that we're underscoring the value here to meet people A, where they're at in their community, where they are comfortable, being able to reach people, particularly immigrants and new Americans who sometimes feel very apprehensive about accessing services in any way and making it as approachable and as welcoming and easy as possible, right? There isn't a whole bunch of paperwork anybody has to fill out. They can just show up at the library. They can show up at one of our CBOs and begin working in we speak. That doesn't mean by no means as we speak the end will be all for anybody, right? It's it's a gateway, it's a path, it's it also is a supplement. There are people that do speak English pretty well. This only bolsters that for them. So um, I think we're talking a little bit about two different things. One that we control and we oversee and that we have um, made a real dent in immigrant communities with. And the other is where is this going? And what is the city and the administration doing to try and open up um, more opportunities for accredited 
learning um, with these populations. And I think we can get back to you with that, but that's not something that we oversee. Got it. And I think that's the concern uh, that okay. these are two different things. And, and what we are asking for is an adult literacy initiative and vision. And that's not what we're getting. And we can work through that. But I think we, I want to yeah. move over to the next question. So we understand that prior to COVID, uh, the pandemic, one of the primary constituent requests of the city's info desk was for a seat in an adult literacy classroom. So how does Moya route that call? What referrals are made? Uh, this is getting to the question that I'm asking before, but this is now in response to COVID. How did Moya route those calls and how are they doing that today? Alex? Yeah. So generally we receive referrals and uh, we, are, we receive referrals from different places, right? Specifically when we get uh, a referral through the info desk, we have amazing staff members that equip that line that are tasked with connecting with partners who do have availability. And when they don't, uh, as Colette mentioned, we do offer the opportunity to engage with We Speak uh, for those that, uh, if we don't have any, if, if the organizations that we're connected to don't have the ability to place them in an ESOL classroom. Okay, how does Moya shape its programs based on constituent calls and requests? So whether the info desk or Moya, um, how does it shape the programs based on the calls? So whether it's at the info desk or on the constituent services hotline? We take all inquiries, all questions, all feedback very seriously. Um, when we hear any kinds of complaint or something isn't working, we immediately address it. That goes from IDNYC, whether we receive an email that somebody can't access the card or something didn't work, they couldn't get an appointment um, to Action mm -hmm. NYC and someone's not able to get through the hotline. The same goes for We Speak. We do everything we can. We actually have a team um, of people outside of the info desk constituent services team that, um, does lots of that work with people with the incoming calls. Um, IDMYC has its own customer service line. Uh, we have the info desk. So we have tried to build out a variety of ways that we have teams of people that address these concerns and also bring feedback right to the leaders of these programs to try and make sure that both the um, New Yorker is addressed and that we're directly speaking with them, but also that the program can, you know, look at it and say, oh, wait, this actually isn't working. This isn't the best way to do it. Let's do it this way and try. We're very flexible in our ability to adjust to what people's needs are. Moya's annual report states that 33% of children in mixed status families live in linguistically isolated households, which suggests that children with proficiency in such linguistically isolated households may bear a disproportionate level of family responsibility, uh, as I kind of spoke to my own experience, mm -hmm. as the only proficient English speaker at home. How does Moya use this data to inform its adult literacy related programming, vision, leadership uh, policies? Alex, do you want to start on literacy and I can take the larger question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying that a lot of We Speak's content, right, addresses some of the biggest challenges that parents have to face. So our curricula is very much about helping parents navigate uh, difficult situations, including how to navigate the, the DOE, right? And so we have an amazing episode that talks parents through what it's like uh, to speak to a teacher and offers language for showing up to those uh, appointments with teachers. So all of the curriculum is about empowering parents to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to really be heroes of their story and be able to understand the services that they have access to and be able to navigate that so that their children don't have to bear the burden. Um, and I definitely empathize, right, as a, as, a, as a immigrant who was born in Dominican Republic, came here when I was seven years old, I definitely know what it's like to have responsibility. And it's really amazing that we have a program that not only provides ESOL content, but really uh, navigate, helps navigate, help parents navigate that. I don't know, uh, Colette, if you want to add to that. And I think as an agency, you know, Moya does lead the charge um, through interagency work 
uh, we work with our agency partners across the city to um, ensure that there are they have they're following all the local laws that there is language access that there is language line that there are supports available we um, do a lot of agency partner trainings um, that address all of the issues that immigrants are uh, are facing including this one um, so I think that we do an excellent job working with our agency partners on a host of uh, issues uh, this included and I'll just add that we most recently partnered with the DOE to provide training for parent coordinators. So that's another way that we ensure that information is channeling, not just through our content, but through individuals that are working directly with immigrant families. How is Moya ensuring that immigrant New Yorkers who may lack digital literacy are still able to access critical information such as the federal immigration updates the new update on census um, that's going to be ending on the 16th, service eligibility, um, everything that that we offer in the city. How yeah, is Moya? Um, <laughs> Moya has a very dedicated staff, I will say that, who work all of the time, um, an outreach team. We partner with all of the agency outreach teams to disseminate information. We host days of action. We even in this post COVID world are have done tons of work with the census team outdoors in a safe uh, way to try and get information to people. Um, on all of the different things that have come down from the federal government, we have continuously uh, worked like a very small army to make sure that both digitally, um, on paper, outreach, different agencies, listservs, uh, emails to agencies, updating our curriculum and our various programs, whether it's the KYR program and putting slides in, any which way that we can try to um, get people the information. Uh, Moya has um, worked across the administration to ensure that people get this information, including working with DOE to make sure that the um, children have it to bring home in a folder, making sure that the parent coordinators are, um, you know, updating parents on, on, on various uh, things that would be critical for them to know in the moment. Uh, our rapid response to uh, the last four years uh, has 24 to 48 hours, we're getting the community's information. And a lot of it is done through social media and maybe on our website, but a large percent of that is done through grassroots, on the ground outreach to communities. So I, I just kind of want to point that uh, I think everything that you just laid out are, are really great approaches. And that those are, those, are, those are important, especially all the analog stuff in person but that doesn't address any of the digital divide and the di digital literacy issues that I think Chair Rose and I spoke to in our opening statements. I, I agree, but um, your question was, how are we? How do we make sure that people who may do not have access to that or cannot access digitally get information? So by no means are we relying on that. The digital divide is big and we are, I said it in my testimony, we have, we have noticed it probably more than most because of We Speak, but also from all of our other programs that COVID-19 has left a large portion of the population out of the equation. Um, this is no more obvious than with the Department of Education and student learners. This would apply to adult learners as well, particularly what um, the Assistant Commissioner of DYCD uh, noted, as well as um, one of the advocates that, you know, these are often the first people who have to go back to work. Um, and so uh, we are working closely with the CTO's office to see um, where, uh, where and what can be done to both address the large broadband disparities. This is not just about getting people devices, right? There is a lack of internet in the city um, and how that's being addressed. The administration did put a, a lot of money, I can pull up my paper so that I'm accurate, um, last May and making sure that there was um, technology given to seniors, technology given to NYCHA, um, trying to get low cost and accessible internet to NYCHA um, in, in various locations where there was none. So um, Alex and the We Speak team have been working very closely in the past few um, months with the CTO's office to see how we are going to really attack this in the next three months as it relates to immigrant communities, what can be done. And um, our commissioner, as, long as, as well as other commissioners are very interested in potential private partnerships to try and get people the actual technology, right? Because it's one thing to have internet, it's another thing to be able to connect. 
um, with the device. Yeah, I mean, that, so, and that's the core of the, of, of the yes. question. How do you get information? And that's digital divide, it's technology, it's infrastructure. And it doesn't sound like there is a, a, a plan for that. And I, I really appreciate that Moya can see things probably more, more intensely because of the immigrant community. And so I wanna say thank you to that. What we're looking for is, is, is what, what is Moya gonna do about it? And, and I think that's, that's, that's the, the ultimate issue. We wanna work with you to figure out what those uh, uh, initiatives could be for the immigrant community. That's what this discussion is trying to focus on. We mm -hmm. know that New Yorkers Chair, have Chairman Cap, Chairman Chaka, if I, sorry, if I may, I, I just, um, I just don't want this to get lost, right? We, Moya, not only have an amazing outreach team, but we work with many of the community-based organizations that you work with to provide Know Your Rights forums. They get updated information almost on a daily basis from our staff. On top of that, uh, we talked a little bit about We Speak, our partnership with the DOE. We distributed the Immigration Resource Guide to over 300,000 people, right? So we're using mixed methods approach that involve working with community-based organizations, as well as working through the channels that the city has to provide printed information because we know how limited the reach is. So we would be happy to continue to partner with you specifically to make sure that, uh, that no stone goes unturned, as they say, um, and that reaching as many people as possible. But I, I really wanna make sure that, that people know that our amazing partners are on the ground, our outreach staff is on the ground, and we're working with city agencies across the board to get printed materials in areas where we know there's a gap. And thank you to the staff. Everyone is working hard and this is not about them. This is about the infrastructure that does not exist today and that will always present a gap. That is what we're trying to highlight. That's what we're trying to focus on and remove uh, from, from this barrier. Otherwise we're gonna have the same issue over and over again. So let's move on to the next question because even if we can get folks engaged in digital communication we have some issues around the safety of that communication uh, through these outreach teams that you're talking about. We have concerns around digital privacy of personal identifying information that keeps immigrant New Yorkers from accessing a lot of these issues, uh, a lot of these initiatives and programs. And um, from we speak to adult literacy classes. So what has Moya done to combat these issues that are also concerns? Are you talking um, about speaking about privacy? Yeah, this is all yeah, about go privacy. Ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> we work very closely with the chief privacy officer. Um, I think we speak is a little bit different because we don't have contracting providers, but when it comes to our program providers, which include Action NYC and others, we have very specific privacy protocols. Uh, that we follow to ensure that information that's being collected is safeguarded. I think when it comes to We Speak, we don't collect information specifically because we're very mindful of uh, challenges that are had when collecting personal information. So I'll just say that, and I don't know, Colette, if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, I was going to say that, and you know, um, uh, Council Member Munchaka, that privacy is something that uh, we take very seriously at IDNYC as well as at Moya. So uh, we have left, as Alex said before, no stone unturned. We absolutely don't want to create any um, privacy issues for any immigrant New Yorker. We also do not want to um, for there to be another barrier why somebody wouldn't come to a class or wouldn't access a service because they are afraid that potentially this could expose them in some way. Um, so uh, with that being said, with all of our programs, there are um, an enormous amount of privacy provisions so that um, we don't we don't hold anybody's personal identifying information. Uh, we make sure that uh, there is immigration status is not collected in all of our programs citywide. That's a um, priority. Uh, so I'm not sure what the concern is, but if you want to expound on it, I'm sure I can address that concern particularly. Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna have to move on uh, to some more questions, but I think I think this is this is a sure. big concern. I think. Engaging your chief privacy officer is not enough. I think you putting something in a, pa a pamphlet is not enough. We're talking about 
really changing hearts and minds on the ground that are terrified, that are not filling out the census. Uh, we have not seen a real shift and change. And the question is who's responsible for that? And, and the mayor's office that holds so much of, of what we're trying to do is at the core and center of that. So we're gonna move on. Um, I wanna talk about uh, the, um, really what supports Moya uh, providing immigrant parents who may face the digital literacy barriers. So I really wanna focus on parents and the language barriers that they experience and all the things that are happening around the schools. How, how are we thinking about this? And I'll give you an example. Uh, a lot of the PTAs in my district are calling me about more adult literacy programming that can happen within their school to help bridge that digital literacy gap, help bridge that adult literacy gap. You heard from the first panelist uh, talk specifically about that. What is Moya doing to support parents in this time? Yep. So from the beginning of the pandemic and when we grappled with all the things that everyone had to uh, quickly shift to, we provided workshops. Um, we held about 10 in total, helping people navigate how to uh, get on Zoom, how to do access some of these programs, uh, software, sorry. Um, and uh, you know, through We Speak, which this is another great example as to why We Speak uh, being as informal and sort of a gateway is, we are able to, and we were able to reach um, many parents, right? Because they were home caring for their children who were remote um, and they were able to, we had classes that we tried very hard to make sure the times were when people could actually access the service. We did a ton in those classes to, to try and help people navigate the technology um, and assist through uh, that platform and getting people information and resources as to where they could, if they needed additional assistance, access it um, through our outreach teams, through our partners, um, really making sure that if people needed any kind of assistance, emergency child care, NYC wellness, uh, whatever the resources were, making sure that parents were supported during this time to the best of our ability. Um, Alex, did you wanna add anything further to that? Yeah, no, you captured it. I guess I'll just uh, emphasize that the people we serve are parents, uh, many of them essential workers, as we mentioned earlier. And so, you know, through We Speak and all of the other outreach methods that we've mentioned today, uh, we do our very best to ensure information is getting to parents uh, in a timely fashion. So um, I'm really hearing that We Speak is a front facing. Um, initiative priority for Moya. And, and I appreciate that. Um, as well as our other programs. As well as the other programs as well, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but We Speak continues to be a, a, a kind of a, a, a pivot too. And, and I think you already know how, how concerned I'm about that. But let's talk a little bit about We Speak. Uh, how does Moya ensure that linguistically relevant teachers are paired with students who could benefit from additional in-language support. How does that matching happen? Does it happen? I'll just say that a lot of our facilitators are former retired individuals, many of them who taught ESOL before. I'll also say that we work with the libraries, right? And libraries have uh, a different way of incorporating our program where they use their own educators. Uh, we work with uh, Fordham University, for example. So we're really, Adding capacity, yes, with volunteers, some of which may not have that background, many do, uh, but also leveraging the existing capacity that organizations have where they do have that experience. I would also say that our staff uh, are uh, of the background. They have a lot of experience creating uh, curricula. And we also work very closely with CUNY. CUNY is our content creator. All of the content that we put out uh, is in partnership with CUNY um, and definitely meets the guidelines that are necessary to ensure that we're doing what we're uh, what what is a core of the program, which is not only building confidence, not only exposing people to services, but also expanding the vocabulary of individuals, many of which do not have an opportunity to be part of a formal classroom. Great. So there's no real matching with linguistically relevant teachers and students, um, but you're building a big base of, of volunteers that are out there doing their best. And, and, I, and I get that. Um, so I would say, uh, we, I'm sorry to interrupt, Chairman Chuck, but that was not, that was not what yeah. we said. 
<laughs> I just okay. want to make so sure the, the content no, no, is. I'm sorry, Alex. I'm going to take this. Alex, I'm going to take this. We did not. We did not talk about all the volunteers doing their best. So let's be clear. I really want to be amazing. clear here. We thank them. I, it's I a very simple I'm, question. I don't know that I'm amazing. Just, I can tell you that we speak is amazing. And the people that the, the 3,400 you know, New that. Yorkers who attended We Speak last year will tell you they had an unbelievable experience. They learned and it, it built about, their confidence. Yes. Let's talk about those New Yorkers. Can you give us the demographic yeah. breakdown of age and native language uh, and any other demographics? But I'm looking for age and native language. New Yorkers who are participating in We Speak. Is that something you have? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. give me one second. So our, our students are between the ages of 18 and 18 and 65 with about 35% um, are uh, within the ages of 18 and 25. Um, and so many of them are Spanish speaking and Chinese speaking. When we look at the demographics of the other language, they're definitely in line with the top 10 languages spoken by LEPs in New York City. Okay, thank you. And if you could, if you can give us, uh, and we're gonna follow up with a, a letter with a more detailed request for the demographics, but it'd be great to kind of see who are, you know, the New Yorkers that are engaging in the program. Um, you know and who else I'm gonna, is engaging I'm gonna in the program? We have visitors from all over the world engaging in our remote program from China, Venezuela, Ecuador, India, France, Russia, Egypt, Vietnam, Iran, Jordan, and Brazil, who are all in our online remote programs. We have taken the global stage. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, really appreciate your time today. And I'm going to hand it back to our committee council. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm now going to call on council members in order uh, they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Okay, seeing no hands, um, I'm just going to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Rose. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I can't find my Zoom hand function, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I need an adult literacy course in. Uh, <laughs> in the um, <laughs> There's one this afternoon. There's one this afternoon. If you'd like to come on board. <laughs> so I, I can't that. find mine either. Don't worry. <laughs> So I just have one more question um, for DYCD. You know, um, last year in September, uh, we had a hearing on adult literacy and DYCD testified that there has been ongoing discussions with providers about whether um, programs should adopt a standard curriculum. Um, at that time, the consensus was that they should not um, and they should allow for flexibility. But has there been any more, um, are there any updates on these discussions? And has COVID-19 influenced whether there should be some curricula standard, at least with respect to digital literacy? Good question. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the, the, all sh the shift to the online uh, teaching, uh, Instructors, programs have to, you know, tweak, revise their lesson plans, curriculum, um, you know, to just to, you know, to meet the, the needs uh, to continue the, uh, uh, the effective uh, instruction. Um, yes, we have actually, I mean, there is no discussion per se on whether there is a need for curriculum or not, but there is certainly a lot of talk about, you know, coming up with some kind of a, a curriculum that would cater to uh, distance learning. Um, you know, we, um, <clears throat> we worked with Google and uh, we looked at their, um, their um, digital um, collection of uh, lesson plans, sort of like a curriculum and we shared, uh, we had best practice sharing with our program. They also shared a lot um, what they have uh, learned about and what, and I'm, I, I'm sure 
you know, you know, this will continue, this conversation will continue. And I hope to work with, uh, you know, some, you know, you know, experts in the field to see if we can actually come up with something that would give general guidance on, uh, uh, on, on remote learning and distance learning. Yeah. So um, what is the, um, what's the goal of the continued discussions? Um, you know, you're discussing best practices. Um, is it to standardize, uh, you know, a, a digital curriculum or is it, you know, what, what are you, what's, you know, what's your goal for um, well, these discussions? Yeah, I mean, when I, so two things, those, you know, ongoing, best practice sharing is really, the goal for that is not necessarily to uh, eventually come up with something. You know, it's really, it's best practice sharing is to learn about how you can, you know, effectively, efficiently for services, uh, how do you use, you know, different platforms and those effectively, how do you engage students in this, in, in using those new tools, that's that's one one thing, and that's very important. And we always do that, and we continue to do that. So the the, the needs of a curriculum, as you just referenced, I think it is very important to have a curriculum. Um, but you know, the whole thing is that when you talk with the providers, uh, you know, they all say they you know they all have their own curriculum. They all have their own lesson, you know, syllabus and lesson plans to follow. Uh, but when you talk about a unit one curriculum, people seem to, you know, uh, you know, feel a little bit, you know, they feel like this that's rigid and, uh, and all that. And I remember uh, a few years ago, we actually developed a curriculum for our young adult literacy program, um, you know, uh, which, which no longer exists, that program. The curriculum was developed with a lot of resources uh, developed, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of resources put into that and we developed one. Um, you know, it, people have mixed, had mixed feelings about it. You know, some people were faithful to it, use it. Some other people, you know, keep on, kept on saying that I can use this as a reference. Um, you know, I have my own stuff. So when we, developed that we want people to use it. So we actually monitored the use of it and tracked it. And we had mixed reactions to that, to be honest with you. Some, you know, love it. Some just say, well, I found that very restrictive and the materials you put there is not always up to date, you know, uh, authentic because things change. Uh, I understand all that, you know, so um, that's why I think it, you know it's it's good to ha to have continued conversations about this, and then we can talk with our TA provider. We can talk with other experts in the area. Uh, but whether to have one of that is really, we also need to in the, listen to our providers. Is um uh, are these best practices sort of um, incorporated in a, a matrix that you use when you do evaluations of these programs? Well, um, you know, program evaluation is really looking at, uh, you know, uh, contract expectations outlined in the, uh, in the contract. The contract says that you need to have X number of hours of staff development minimum, and you have to document those activities, and you have to give us a plan that shows that, you know, staff development uh, are done purposely and addressing specific needs of the staff that we monitor and we, we evaluate them all. But best practices, you know, it's something that, you know, for people to learn best about, practice. enrich their knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, your, your best practice may not be the best for my classroom, mine may not be for yours, but it's always good to be informed to know what's out there. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a recommendation, and I I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Here.
Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, I'm just going to confirm that there are no further questions. Okay, with that, we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify, and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Stephen Mahoney to testify. After Stephen Mahoney, we will hear from Fatma Ghailan, followed by Hanif Toussaint. Uh, Stephen Mahoney, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good morning. I'm Steve Mahoney, Assistant Director of Adult English Language and Literacy at the New York Public Library. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, Committee on Youth Service Chair Deborah Rose, and Committee on Immigration Chair Carlos Menchaca, and the entire City Council for holding this hearing and your commitment to libraries and immigrant rights. As the nation's largest public library system and third largest globally, NYPL features 88 neighborhood branches and four scholarly research centers that serve the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. For 125 years, the libraries provided resources and opportunities for all New Yorkers and offers immigrants and their families access to cultural programs, literary resources, and other critical supports across all ages, education levels, and ethnicities. NYPL provides essential tech services that play a role in closing the digital divide critical English language and literacy classes, comprehensive career and job resources, as well as essential homework and tutoring services for all New Yorkers, from toddlers to older adults. Our ESOL and ABE classes have provided newcomers with literacy skills to better engage in their communities and participate more in city and career opportunities. Before the pandemic, we taught ESOL in 39 locations. Amid the pandemic, we were able to serve over 76 of our existing clients in FY20. That's over 5,000 individuals. In FY19, we served over 7,000 students through in-person classes. Our classes provide patrons with critical resources such as eBooks, which help them complete coursework regardless of location. Additional multimedia resources like We Speak NYC are included in our lessons, which build on students' language competencies. As such, NYPL continues to seek innovative means to reach our core audience while creating access to digital literacy programs on various platforms. Moreover, through an FY20 City Council allocation, NYPL provided ESOL classes at two correctional facilities on Rikers Island this year, offering literacy services to a significantly vulnerable population. Since 2012, our Tech Connect initiative has supported adult learners of diverse backgrounds and cultures in their pursuit to upskill in tech. TechConnect offers classes in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, and Bengali, and provides a range of programming from Microsoft Office to coding. Following the closure of our branches, we pivoted to an online platform with classes held throughout the day. Since the library's virtual transition, we also increased our literacy, our literary collections via Simply E by thousands. Simply Ease the library's free e-reader app that brings our collection of more than 300,000 e-books and audiobooks to our readers in an accessible format. Since March, we gained over 57,000 new e-readers. Access via any mobile device, our Simply E collection includes materials in Spanish, Chinese, Bengali, Russian, and Arabic. So from pre-literate to advanced English speakers, NYPL provides early education to formalize language instruction with support critical literacy skills for all New Yorkers. Whether in person or virtually, the New York Public Library services continue to help immigrants succeed in all areas of their lives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Fatma Kailan. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay, 
Now I'm unmuted. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Or actually, good afternoon. I'm Fatma Haydan, Assistant Director of the Adult Learner Program at Queen's Public Library. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today on behalf of our President and CEO, Dennis Walcott, and everyone at QPL. Thank you, Chairs Manchaka and Rose, as well as the members of the committees for holding this hearing and providing me the opportunity to testify on this important topic. Libraries are the great equalizer in our democratic society. As such, public libraries play a crucial role in supporting new immigrants. Serving the most ethnically diverse county in America, Queens Public Library has long been a primary destination for immigrants. New Yorkers. Uh, QPL's New American Programs, NAP, provides an array of programs and special services to help the borrowers, immigrants integrate into American society and share the diverse cultures with the community at large. In 1977, QPL became the first public library in the nation with a department divide, dedicated to providing comprehensive programs and services to immigrants. Almost half of the residents of Queens County are foreign born, making this program a vital resource. Um, so QPL uh, NAP program works closely with the adult learning program in developing a wide range of programming to support our immigrant communities and their unique needs. Um, we offer adult basic education for immigrants covering topics such as math, reading and writing skills, uh, as well as high school equivalency instruction for our immigrants who did not complete high school in their home country and whose high school diploma is not recognized in the United States. Our immigrant focused programs and services are continuously in high demand. In fiscal year 2019, QPL welcomed over 18,200 participants to more than 8,600 immigrant focused programs. We hosted over 4,600 ESOL sessions, which had over 4,100 participants. Our ESOL students are seeing results. Uh, they experienced an average educational gain of 59%. Uh, and our jo Job and Business Academy, uh, IELCE program, offers a number of classes and trainings for technology uh, training and home health aid jobs. So in March, Queens Public Library closed our physical doors, but we continued offering classes right away to our students serving over 1,800 students and hosting over 100 virtual courses. Our NAP program did the same, and we continued uh, with training our teachers and staff members. Over 77 uh, teachers and staff members are now certified. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Hanif Toussaint. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chairs Machenka and Rose and members of both committees for the opportunity to testify today. I am Hanif Toussaint, Brooklyn Public Library's ESOL and Business English Program Coordinator. Thank you to Speaker Johnson, Majority Leader Combo and Finance Chair Drum for all your support of library services with your help, BPL was able to pivot its programs almost as soon as this pandemic ha happened. We launched virtual and remote by phone versions of our adult basic ed, high school equivalency and ESOL classes, conversation groups, citizenship workshops, as well as multilingual story times for our youngest patrons. Now, though this pandemic has changed how we deliver services to New Yorkers, I assure you that service to those most impacted by this pandemic, our elderly, our marginalized, our immigrants are still intact. BBL has provided ESO instruction for over 35 years and our goal has not changed even in this current climate. We serve non-native professionals, blue collar workers, stay at home providers, college students, newly arrived immigrants, enabling them to achieve competency in English language and digital skills that are vitally needed to function effectively as workers, parents, citizens, while navigating the complexities of New York City. From the onset of COVID-19, BPL's ESOL program has assessed and enrolled hundreds of ESOL participants providing virtual instruction in 16 ongoing classes for civics education and digital fluent, uh, fluency. 
We facilitate 13 We Speak NYC sessions virtually and currently have four online citizenship classes and 12 virtual conversation groups. This new mode of programs pose new challenges and compounds existing ones for participants and the library. Access to technology is a major challenge for immigrant patrons. Without our branches, Wi-Fi, technology and resources, ESOL participants are unlikely to have similar or comparable access to computers or internet at home. To address these challenges, we have launched low-tech options in our programs, creating photocopy packets for patrons who cannot participate in online classes that can be picked up from our open branches. We have held writing workshops by phone for ABE students and our tutors have been engaging ABE students by phone to help those who aren't connected online to improve their literacy skills. BPL grant writers have reached out to funders to explore the feasibility of providing technology and Wi-Fi to our learners. There is a major need here that we hope our government and foundation partners will seek to address. While we're doing our best to ensure a continuous learning experience for existing students. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now ask if council members have questions for this panel. Council member Chin. Yeah, I have a question for the uh, panelists uh, talking about um, the uh, ESL program, ESL programs at the libraries. I just want to know, like, if you could tell me in terms of um, the funding uh, for these classes, uh, are those fundings from the city? And also, like, do you have to provide uh, data um, to the funding source, to the city, in terms of the, uh, the number of uh, immigrant adults that participate uh, in your English language classes? I will, I'll say for the New York Public Library, uh, our ESOL classes are supported through a mix of city, state, and private funding. Mm -hmm. And for various funders, we're providing yearly update reports. And Which, uh, for the city funding, is that from DYCD? Yes. Oh, so you're part of the DYCD portfolio then? We are, and uh, it's the same for Queens Public Library. Okay, uh, but what, I, I'm just curious, like how do we compile all the data that shows the number of immigrant adults that are, um, that are taking these classes? Because I think early on um, from the early testimony we talk about, you know, how many, um, percentage or limited uh, English speakers and just wanted to get an idea in terms of like who's pulling all this information together so we know like is the majority of this population is being served you know by city programs by CBOs by the library by CUNY it's like I, I just want to really get a sense of like are we are we providing enough right uh, are there still a large population out there that are not being served? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, if there's a, a way of really collecting all this information, I don't know which city agency, uh, that's what I, my question earlier, you know, like CUNY's providing classes, DOE's providing classes, the library's providing classes, CBO, it's like, okay, are we serving all the immigrant population that needs this service or we serve it only half. So that would give us a better sense of like, well, how much more funding that we need to advocate for. So chair, I don't know if we can really get the city to like, that's where the coordination is. Like somebody should be gathering this information so we have a better sense of what is, what's the need out there um, in terms of the, the population that's still need the service. Thank you. Well, we do get our numbers from different city agencies and auditing uh, agencies. 
the Queen's Public Library does definitely not serve everyone we could and who needs to be served. Again, we talked about the waiting lists earlier. It is true that we have different programs from the different agencies, CBOs, universities, colleges, uh, but it still does not serve the need. There is a huge population that is underserved and does not know how to go about finding services or um, uh, communicating with uh, programs. Um, so I would say, for example, for Queens, uh, we, we know in numbers that we have over 50% that is um, uh, foreign born uh, who need uh, language uh, programs. We have a high number of uh, Queens born and foreign born without uh, high school equivalency, but the library offers classes and serves, you know, a few thousand a year. So that definitely does not cover the need. Yeah, I would say the New York Public Library, um, the demand far exceeds our ability to serve everybody looking for services. Um, within the last four years or so, uh, we really increased our informal ESOL programming for students who may not be available to meet the rigor of our formal ESOL instruction that uh, we provide a more flexible schedule for informal instruction using um, We Speak NYC and other conversation materials. And uh, this is also the first point of contact for many immigrants in the city that they come to the library for a low intensity educational experience. So coming for a conversation group, uh, two hours, one day a week, uh, that could then be an on-ramp to then transitioning to our formal ESOL program. So it's our way of being able to cast a wider net in serving the needs of the city. Uh, I would like also to add that, I'm, I'm sorry, Hanif, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to add that from the council member's question, uh, Trees, are you looking for an overarching body that sort of manages or can provide information on all these ESOL and immigrant programs. So whereby we can find pockets that is not being served appropriately. Um, I mean, that is a welcoming thing. However, right now with all three, you know, libraries and even our CBOs and colleges and so forth, we take a poll, we survey our our districts, our neighborhoods, and so forth. I mean, BPL, uh, through our 58, 59 branches, we're basically less than, you know, half a mile within, within in, in a neighborhood. So we're able to survey um, our local neighborhoods, and we can target, you know, where the greatest needs are, so we can provide classes in those neighborhoods. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now ask if any other council members have questions. Councilmember Menchaca. Yes, th and, and thank you for this panel. Uh, the, the dedication is, is real and the hurdles are also real. And a lot of the discussion that we're really linking here is about digital divide, the infrastructure. And so if there's anything else that you want to add to that, I want, I want this to be an opportunity to really think about what those barriers are and what the city can do. Uh, this is a city council hearing. We are, we are thinking about a lot of things, policy, but we're also thinking about budget um, as we get into this next year's budget and that's on everyone's mind. Uh, is there something that we can do and really hear from you about what is needed for training, for tutorials, um, anything relating to digital that you haven't said already? I'm happy to start. Uh, yes. The list is long for sure. <laughs> uh, Good. And first thing I'd like uh, to just mention that the number of people we've been serving under certain grants, whether it is city or federal, you know, the amount of money we used to serve 
uh, let's say a thousand people before now can only serve 200 since the requirements are different. Since now we are required to uh, do job training, we're doing case management. So again, the, the dollar does not go as far as it used to before. Again, you know, the quality is definitely better. We're preparing our students for the job market, but we're not reaching to the core population that only needs to talk to a teacher, that only needs to go to the store and to, uh, you know, for basic everyday living. Um, and to talk about needs, you know, the first thing is nobody was prepared, nobody was trained to work remotely. So that's the first, you know, hurdle that we all face is, okay, right. the libraries closed their physical doors, but we were offering classes right away. We continued supporting our students right away, which required providing our staff with computers, providing them with hotspots. You know, you start with your staff and then training them on how to use it. You know, simple things as just using Zoom or any other platform requires a lot of training and a lot of work. And then you transfer that to the students who are, again, grappling with just day by day, making sure that they have food on the table, but they have other skills that are added to their, you know, dig digital, not digital, but literacy skills. So computers, as uh, our colleague mentioned earlier, laptops, hotspots, and training on how to train. So our staff also needs support to be able to provide the right uh, materials and uh, trainings for our students. Now, can I can I just uh, go a little bit deeper and ask that training that's required and needed for, um, say, the library and, and the institution, is that something that you're seeing as ubiquitous in understanding and the training? Like, is it the same training that everyone needs to get? Is there something that is universal in training that everyone do if the city was prepared to, uh, to, to do en masse? Uh, I'm hearing from teachers, I'm hearing from parents, I'm hearing from so many different places that want training. Are we talking about the same training or are we, are we talking about something very specific about what you do, your program, your teacher, what's happening at the library? Well, some of it is the same, which is basic digital literacy. You know, how to turn on a computer, how to connect a mouse, how to uh, access Zoom, how to use the basic functions of Google Classroom. There is the basic. And then there is also instruction over, you know, online, virtually. So we all talk about synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Well, first of all, what does each one mean? And then what are the requirements? Again, we train all of our teachers, you know, to engage their students. So we want our classes to be communicative and to teach our students to learn. You know, we're talking in dragogy. Now, how do you do that virtually? So I have a group of students. So let's say you're all my students. How do I engage all of you? It's hard to get you to do pair work, group work, participate for people to understand and then all the background that's behind you so sometimes you know basic things of just having a virtual background using headphones so there are two folds two kinds of training there's the basic of your teacher and staff being able to use a computer but there's also how to deliver training and lessons virtually got it thank you this is just helping me think about what we can do to start presenting some ideas so this is this is helpful I'd like to say that um, when we're registering our students, uh, we try to develop curricula that's addressing students where they're at. And so we, as we're registering each student, we're trying to do a tech inventory and a needs assessment. Um, in our last cohort of synchronous learning, uh, we surveyed students, how are you accessing our classes? Um, about 50% stated they were logging in with a desktop or a laptop then 25% on a tablet, but then there were still 25% using their cell phone. And of those 25% on a cell phone, they're not necessarily having access to Wi-Fi, they're using data. Um, have using the data on their phone can seriously impede access to the class and then staying in the class. So um, if you're talking about opportunities to provide greater opportunity and access for students in the digital divide, uh, we could see a great use for additional access to Wi-Fi for our students. Yeah, that's been, that's been incredibly clear even before this hearing, but I think we need to hear it in this hearing. 
and I'm glad you're, uh, and I think you're going to hear across the entire set of panels. And so that that's just going to be helpful for information so that we can take it back to all the council members and say, we got to solve this. Thank you. That, that's it for me. Thank you, Chair. Um, are there any other questions from council members? Okay, um, we'll be moving on to our next panel. Our next panel um, will be Ira Yanquit, followed by Lena Cohen, followed by Liza Schwarzwald, followed by Stacy Evans. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Ira Yanquit to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Chuck and Chair Rose for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ira Yanquit and I am the Executive Director of the Literacy Assistance Center, a 37-year-old not-for-profit organization dedicated to strengthening and expanding the adult education system and also a proud member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy. This past May, the LAC conducted a survey of over 50 adult literacy providers in the city to learn about the impact of COVID-19 on students and programs. The findings were sobering but not surprising. We learned that adult literacy students were struggling with job and income loss, supporting their children's homeschooling, food and housing insecurity, caring for family members, risks as essential workers, immigration issues, mental health issues, and access to health care, and that all of these issues were exacerbated by limited reading, writing, English language, and or digital literacy skills. Moreover, lack of access to hardware and reliable internet service were a major barrier to students participating in classes and respondents estimated that an average of 65% of their students were facing technology obstacles. At the same time, we saw that adult literacy programs rose to the moment quickly, moving and adapting their instruction to remote platforms like Zoom, Google Classroom, and WhatsApp, excuse me, and providing additional support, one-on-one -on -one support to their students through phone calls, text messages, online platforms, emails, and expanded support services including providing uh, um, information on rapidly changing public health situations. Still, there is concern, that we, we learned from the student that, excuse me, uh, we learned for, that for students with reliable technology and internet access, remote learning offered some benefits, including limit, ability to limit travel and childcare expenses, participate in classes at a wider range of times, attend classes even if they are ill or less mobile, and gain digital literacy skills while engaging with other content. Strikingly, nearly half the programs reported that they envision continuing to offer some form of remote teaching even after they are able to reopen in person, and they see this as an opportunity to serve a greater number of students at a time of increased need and demand. Still, there is concern that an over-reliance on remote adult literacy programming could leave behind those adults who have, do not have hardware, dependable internet and access, or digital literacy skills, and almost all the providers expressed the need for greater professional development on remote teaching and learning, more resources for their students, and increased play planning time for their staff. Indeed, as the DYCD-funded technical assistance provider to community-based adult literacy programs, the Literacy Assistance Center has seen an unprecedented demand for our services over the last six months. We responded by providing regular webinars that introduced teachers to Zoom and other online tools, by holding individual coaching sessions while te with teachers and providing customized professional development programs to assist with the integration of digital platforms and the design of remote curriculum and instruction. So what do we need to do? First, we must ensure that every adult literacy student who need it is provided with the necessary um, hardware and free internet to be able to access classes. Second, we must move, we, as we move toward envisioning the FY22 budget, we must find the resources to invest in the adult literacy pilot project that NICAL has been discussing with you and your colleagues prior to the pandemic. And third, over the long term, we need to quintuple the cumulative funding for adult literacy education in New York City. Currently, the total state and city funding for adult literacy education in New York City amounts to approximately $85 million a year, less than $40 a year for each of the 2.2 million adults in need and just over $1,000 for every student who is able to access classes. We need to work together to dramatically increase this funding, both to serve far more than the 3, .4, 3 to 4% of the 2.2 million adults in need that we're currently serving, and to provide these students with the, and their teachers and their programs with a full range of resources, supports, and benefits they need and deserve. Sorry for the technological glitch, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank, thank you, you for your testimony. 
I'd now like to welcome Lena Cohen to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Lena Cohen. I'm a policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, first, just want to say thank you, Chairman Chaka, Chair Rose, and all of the city council members for being on today and discussing something that often gets overlooked, which is adult literacy education. Um, for background, United Neighborhood Houses is a policy and social change organization representing 44 settlement houses uh, that serve over 765,000 New Yorkers each year through neighborhood-based programs and services. Thanks to the city council, adult literacy programs are one of the few services available in New York City that meet immigrants and adult learners where they're at uh, by offering them real accredited educational gains. Um, and that really is thanks to the leadership in the city council. Um, since the COVID-19 outbreak, community-based programs have transitioned to remote learning with positive results, as we've already heard from some of our colleagues. And I want to emphasize that this is an effective, streamlined, holistic approach. It's something the City Council celebrates and supports, and we hope the administration will fully embrace the community-based model, too. Nonprofit providers are fighting to keep their doors open right now. And Really, every dollar is essential to ensuring that they can do that. Uh, that's why I want to point out that we're very concerned that it remains unclear whether the full amount of money that the administration allocated to adult literacy providers in fiscal year 21 was actually spent on DYCD contracts. As the economic crisis we're in gets worse, the administration needs to be transparent on this. Um, and we urge the administration to recognize the effectiveness of the programs we're talking about today, um, because they really are a one-stop shop for everything that uh, we know our adult learning population needs. I'll close by saying that the community-based organization sector uh, is ready to work with you to figure out how the city can navigate this, um, or can navigate the financial burden of this pandemic. Um, and we're really excited to see adult literacy programs lifted up uh, because we know they work and it's something to be proud of and uh, figure out how to be effective leaders in this space. I look forward to, par to partnering with the city council moving forward and just again want to say thank you for this time. Thank you for your testimony. I now like to turn to Liza Schwartzwald to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you Chairs Menchaca and Rose um, for the opportunity to testify and for the continued investments of the city in adult literacy. My name is Liza Schwartzwald. I'm a manager of education policy at the New York Immigration Coalition, an umbrella policy and advocacy organization of more than 200 groups serving immigrants and refugees across New York State. Um, I came here for my family. I want better for my family. That's a direct quote from Carol, a student at the Chinatown Manpower Project. While Carol has survived in New York City using her children as translators, she knows her children will eventually move out and she will be on her own. Since this realization, Carol has made it her mission to be more confident and reach out to more people using her English. Carol found CMP through her work union three years ago. Since joining the adult literacy classes, Carol has improved so much that she has found a job as a home health aide and feels so confident that she said, I can even call my patient's doctor and make appointments for them. They understand me. Carol is one of the many students who have benefited from adult literacy classes and has kept connected with her adult literacy community throughout the entirety of this crisis. The need for New York City's adult literacy system for students like Carol has never been more desperate. A generation of our most vulnerable youth are being completely excluded from learning because their parents and grandparents can't access information online, don't have or use devices, and can't read emails coming from their schools only in English. When parents can't speak English and can't connect, their children can't either. And that is a huge loss for the entire family. Our adult literacy system has built a web of support, bolstering these families to help them address all of these challenges together with one trusted partner. It's been an incredibly powerful approach during this crisis, but we are not able to serve anywhere near the amount of families who need this support. And parents and their children are the ones that are paying the price for that. And I think New York City as a whole. 
So to support these families, we asked the city for a few things. One, keep adult literacy programs whole, restore the 12 million that we've had and consider expanding that money. And then also ensure timely payments of F1, FY21 contracts to make sure that we can all continue going and keep the structure of the adult literacy system sound. To provide adult literacy students with internet enabled devices as we have done with the K through 12 system. You know, the, the students in K through 12 have received iPads, have received laptops that have not only internet access, but also hotspots. So the, the child's device can actually support five other devices um, for internet connection. That's been an excellent way. Um, and then third, I, I will echo Ira here and say invest to fund the NICAL pilot program with an increased rate over the next few years. That would allow the field to demonstrate that programs with truly sufficient funding can go above and beyond to provide all the assistance that families need, including digital literacy, which has um, expired. so critical this year. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Stacy Evans. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Rose, and members of the Committees on Immigration and Youth Services. I'm Stacey Evans, University Director for Language and Literacy Programs at CUNY. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your ongoing focus on adult literacy and services for immigrant New Yorkers. For nearly 40 years, CUNY has helped adults develop foundational skills critical to achieving their goals. CUNY offers 15 programs in English for speakers of other languages and seven occupational training programs specifically for English language learners. New Yorkers who lack English language proficiency cannot access higher education, training, and employment opportunities. In addition, digital literacy skills are essential for accessing government programs, finding community-based services, connecting with children's teachers, and finding education and workforce training programs. A September article from the Migration Policy Institute notes that the proportion of US adults with no computer experience is much higher for immigrants who speak a language other than English at home. The digital divide is often greater for people of color, those with lower incomes, and those with lesser levels of education. These are the same New Yorkers who attend our programs. When COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, adult literacy programs needed to shift online which presented seemingly insurmountable obstacles, particularly the concern that many students lacked the skills and tools to participate in a meaningful way. Digital inclusion was a serious issue before the pandemic and became more pronounced and acute with quarantine. The transition to online learning presented serious challenges. Aside from having to learn new technology, students had to sort out how best to access online content. Many lacked adequate internet service at home if they had service at all. Many lacked computers or tablets to access virtual classrooms. Many also had to juggle school, work, homeschooling their children, and sharing home devices with children and other family members. Programs and students' determination made the move online successful. Staff helped students access free and low-cost internet services. The university was able to provide loaner devices to some students. Webinars and screencasts were created to demonstrate the use of various tools. CUNY's professional development team facilitated teacher trainings and resource shares, joined Zoom classes to support instruction, and created instructional materials. Program case managers help students access food resources, financial help, health information, and legal support. To quote one program director, all staff took a no student left behind approach to remote learning. A number of positives have come from our shift to online learning. Students are using asynchronous learning platforms to build support networks and friendships outside of class. Students' technology confidence and skills have increased. Most importantly, students have persisted. They are attending classes and taking on the challenge of learning the digital skills necessary to support their continued program participation. We are grateful to the Council's support and the commitment to helping immigrant New Yorkers achieve English proficiency and adapt to their lives in the city. CUNY is proud to be an essential partner in the network for adult literacy providers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now ask if council members have questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, pre please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council Member Mintaka. Hi everyone. And I wanna say thank you uh, to you all. You are NICAL, uh, the coalition that has been working on this for such a long time. I wanna thank you for your work. Um, and now more than ever, really listening to what you're saying becomes even more critical that we understand the issues and respond immediately 
in this pandemic, the pandemic that is a health, a public health issue, but it's also an economic issue and an access issue. And I just want to lift something that you all said really in, 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 in different ways, but are saying the same thing, that in order for us to move through this, we need to acknowledge that the issues that are coming in are, are both in our youth that are in this uh, public education system conundrum and that that same issue is with our parents and the adults that are in that same family. Both of them are experiencing Wi-Fi issues, both of them are experiencing technology issues and that we need to address them all, that they're equal because this is about a family. This is about a family that needs access to all these services. And so that, that just can't be um, ignored. And I think before it was a different uh, it was a different need because the need was not that great. We're now 100% remote. Who knows when we're going to go back to a place where classroom space becomes an, a, a, a a new norm? But but this is this is where we are right now. And and I think I just want to articulate that and 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 really kind of repeat that back. The next thing I want to say is that the pilot becomes another important conversation that we're talking about quality education. That quality is also changing as well. Uh, we need so many wraparound services, but we need to pay teachers what they are worth. The things that they are now holding, uh, and this is the same thing that's happening with, if you if you listen to the UFT uh, teachers and what they're having to hold, the training, the training is needed, the support is needed, and the need for more resources. If we want this to be a successful component of our recovery, we have to fund it. And, I, and that's what I heard. Uh, I think the last thing that I want to maybe ask, those are more statements, are um, some of the recommendations that you laid out in terms of what we can actually do to move, move this conversation forward and really ask the mayor's office to prepare for a budget that puts adult literacy at the front end and not wait until the very end when we're negotiating this budget and the final pieces. This should be at the forefront of the mayor's office. Uh, and at the forefront of the preliminary budget that we could see early 2021. So are there, is, is there just one thing that you want to, I'm giving you the opportunity to talk about that can, that can really kind of highlight what the city of New York can do to address the issues that you're, that you're speaking to. I think part of this is shifting from seeing adult literacy education as a supplement to the uh, education system writ large and a privilege for a select few um, when we're only talking about serving three to four percent of the 2.2 million in need and really seeing it as an essential and vital part of our educational system and a right to all that needs it. Everything to me flows from there because if you believe that this is a right if you believe that it's a, it's a moral obligation of a progressive city, of a sanctuary city, um, then, then you start to work toward a vision for how to fully fund it, both fully funding in terms of um, providing the resources to serve a significantly greater number and fully funding it to give the students who are in those classes and the programs that run those classes the resources that they need. And I think we at NICAL could certainly lay out um, a vision for how to expand those services and resources over time. I mentioned in my testimony that the Literacy Assistance Center is leading an initiative that's calling for five times city and state funding. Currently city and state funding um, it, for New York City is approximately $85 million. We'd like to get that up to a half a billion dollars and really be able to serve those who need services. And we'd love to work with you and your colleagues to lay out that vision. And and I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, thank you, Ira. I, th I think Ira lays out uh, some really specific and uh, forward looking plans to improve the, the, uh, the quality of service as well as um, the experience for both teachers and students, ultimately setting New York up for a, um, a better future. And, and just to add on to that from, from the logistical end, I suppose, um, it's really important, I think, first that New York as a city recognizes it already has a system for adult literacy education that works and it works really well. It's just 
extremely underfunded. Um, but that, you know, that, that gives us something really solid to work with. Uh, there are many things that we are committed to improving within the program in terms of curriculum, in terms of data management and collection, but um, just in general, the fact that uh, we have um, many providers based in New York City that are doing what they can to uh, serve as many individuals in need of literacy support as possible um, just means that these providers need to be uh, recognized, their work needs to be uplifted, um, and ultimately they, they have yet to see that in uh, a, a anything more than a modest investment from the administration's um, support for this sector uh, throughout the last eight years. And so um, we're really thankful for the progress the sector has made um, to get us to a point where we can say, let's let's invest in this system that we've established together. Um, but that really requires transparency and understanding where every dollar is going now more than ever, since we are in a very severe budget crisis. Yes. And, and, uh, let me just ask uh, this last question. And, and Liza, if you come in and offer your, your perspective, let me know, or you just go ahead and- No, go ahead. I, I, I would echo what they said. And just, yeah. Just appreciate the awesome. two generation outlook um, and the importance of adult literacy, the adult literacy system, working with other systems like the Department of Education, working with people to ensure that as we're looking at an economic crisis, as we're looking at an educational crisis, knowing that this system is actually perfectly situated to start addressing all of those yeah. things together. Right, including even the young person at home trying to learn if we can solve the adult literacy piece, we solve the young person piece and actually create synergy here that that is just waiting for us to actually prioritize. And, and, I, and I see that more clearly. Uh, the, the transparency piece is important. And one of those pieces is about the increase in the number of seats and the extension of contracts. Have, have any, has anyone in the administration reached out to you about that increase in contracts uh, with the seats and slots has that been communicated to, to NICAL at all? We just heard that it was, we confirmed it today that they are putting more funding, where they're actually increasing it in a few hundred slots for, for more providers. Did you all get a communication about that? So what I know, because as, as, as was mentioned earlier, the LEC is the technical assistant provider to DYCD. So we work very closely with them. My understanding is that um, the contracts for providers, and I know there are providers in this meeting who could speak to this, are, are moving forward. They're moving forward slowly. Um, I think there's been layers of additional review um, that, that they've had to go through this particular year. Um, but uh, the, the, the question of expansion of services, um, you know, this is going to be an interesting year because on the one hand, there are individuals who have been in classes in the past who because of the digital literacy and hardware issues that we mentioned are not able to continue with their classes. On the other hand, um, uh, there are those who otherwise wouldn't have been able to access classes because of work time, childcare needs, um, uh, mobility issues who are now able to attend those classes. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how the numbers of participants this year with the same level of funding compares to years past and whether we see with remote learning, um, if we get a greater number, a smaller number, and then I think the data analysis has to be about, well, have the demographics shifted, have, the, have the, the, the profiles of the students shifted, even if the numbers are the same or increased, who have we gained, who have we lost, how are the characteristics differently? I think there's also a question for those of us in NICAL about the 6.4 million, I believe it is on the admin side, is all of that going to the expansion of contracts as I believe was intended, or is some of that still going to Moya or other city agencies in the past It went to community schools? So we really don't know where all the money has gone to, even though whatever money is being allocated seems to be moving, albeit slowly. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to the bottom of a lot of that. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back to uh, committee council and I will be stepping out for a few minutes to make a statement at another hearing where I'm chairing with uh, Rivera and Cabrera on the census. And so I'll be in and out. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Council Member Chin, would you like to ask a question? Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you to this panel. I think it's really enlightening to really um, to learn the the you know the broader outlook and uh, and the coalition um, view of of the um, adult literacy and and the you know the the amount of funding that really need um, to be provided and the small percentage of you know people who are being served. I mean that's what earlier I was asking like. Like how many people are actually, you know, getting this service, uh, and it's very unclear. Uh, yes, you know, we fight for money; it's not enough, and there is such a growing, you know, immigrant population that can definitely uh, use this. And I think going forward in the future, really looking at remote uh, learning as a real opportunity to engage more people. I think early on, I think it was from Ira's testimony. I mean, yeah, I mean, like we're talking about DOE offering, uh, you know, tablets and hot, hot spot and to that student and that student is within the family. And if that services could be also utilized by the adult parents, I mean, just imagine that we, we would reach a lot more people, but the problem is the lack of coordination within the administration. Like everybody's on their own and nobody, and that's what I asked earlier. Is there a deputy mayor that's like, you know, overseeing all this and, and really looking at how do we, you know, provide the resources and, and make the connections so everyone can have an access. I mean, yeah, they're providing tablets to seniors in NYCHA. Well, if that seniors happen to be, you know, in a family where, where there are kids and they're adults, I mean, there are opportunity for them to really learn, to learn together, or the, the kid can help the, the grandparent, but we just don't have that information. And I think we really need to figure out how do we get it from the administration and also utilizing the opportunity. I know there is not enough funding and I'm not even sure like, you know, what the state is doing in terms of their share in the federal government, but hopefully in the future, I mean, if there's another, you know, stimulus packet that comes in, I think we really need to be in a position to advocate, you know, for enough funding, for more funding, uh, you know, for, for these programs and really look at a broader outlook in terms of how do we kind of look at um, the learning possibility of learning English and adult learning and job training, um, you know, using technology and really make sure there's adequate funding. I know for a lot of the CBO, it's not even just funding for these programs, right? You're, I know right now we're funding for, try to fight for the indirect cost that was promised uh, so the organization can survive. But I think this is such an important service, you know, to the city, not just immigrant population, adult population um, that can, you know, utilize, um, adult literacy so they can improve and learn the technology so they can get a better job, get a promotion, earn more money. All that is connected. So I think that is really important that all the, the coalition and, and the, the, you know, the advocacy community really work with us. I think in this upcoming budget with the council to really strategize, what are some of the things that we should be pushing for uh, in terms of, you know, more funding, how much more, and then the statistic to back it up. Uh, and then also a, a really a, a comprehensive view of what, you know, the future of, you know, remote learning and technology and then how do we sort of really utilize this uh, to provide better services and get, you know, more people included. I would just say that, you know, there, there is a deputy mayor that adult education falls under. It's deputy mayor Phil Thompson, who's uh, strategic policy, policy initiatives. Because adult, adult literacy is seen as being part of the workforce system, adult literacy is part of uh, the purview of the mayor's office of workforce development. I'm not saying that's the right place for it. I don't believe that's the right place for it, but that's where it sits. And so if there's, if there's a conversation to be had it's to try to push to see the funding increased. Yes, that's, that's the first thing, but to also see the attention that is paid by, 
by the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and the Deputy Mayor for, for Strategic Policy Initiatives to adult education increase. Like the funding is so small for adult literacy, I feel like it it falls down on the on the the list of important topics to talk about when it actually should be obviously a much more important uh, thing for people to focus on. Um, but starting that conversation with Phil Thompson would be something I'm sure many of us would be happy to <laughs> engage in with you. I think we could do that. I know Phil. Um, I mean, it just like, as I said earlier, I chair the Committee on Aging. There is no deputy mayor overseeing uh, Department for the Aging. I think DYCD is all, all human services. I mean, that's why the seniors, you know, the older population doesn't get recognized. And the budget for the Department of Aging is like less than half a percent of the city's budget. It, it's just so ridiculous that we're not, you know, meeting the need of this growing population. So it, it's the same all around. And that's why we're, we're you know, pushing the, the mayor and, and the administration, you know, they kind of put more emphasis you know, on this group that is really the one that's really helping build a city. So I think going forward, we'll, um, I'll talk to, you know, Council Member Rose, right? We could ask for a, a meeting with Deputy Mayor Thompson and really to, to get him to, to help us uh, to strategize a little bit. And I think we really need to have a con comprehensive plan going forward. Um, I know some of us are, are term limited and we want to do whatever we can to lay a strong foundation before we leave office. Uh, because, you know, it's like every year we fight so hard just to get the small amount of money put back at the end. And as, as you know, uh, Councilman Mchaka said earlier, it should be in the preliminary budget. It should be upfront. And so that's why I think the, the important work, you know, needs to start now and we need to make sure that going forward, that the emphasis and you know people do recognize the importance of you know adult literacy, adult education for the city, for the city to recover and for the city to grow. Uh, that is you know this is so important. So I really thank all the you know all the advocates and all the providers for the great work that you're doing. But you need to get recognized and you need to get the support. Thank you, Council Member Chin. I want to thank you for those remarks. And um, you, uh, council member uh, and chair Menchaka and I are both all on the, um, on the budget negotiating team. And um, I think it's really a great idea that we put together a strategic plan for how we're gonna address, you know, um, adult literacy, seniors and, and our youth services yep. populations. So I, I think the three of us will make a dynamic team and, uh, and uh, we want to thank the advocates for giving us all of the information that we need to fight, you know, a very important battle. So that's true. We'll do thank that. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Jay Rose. Yes. <laughs> thank you, council member. Uh, seeing no other questions, we will be moving to our next panel. Our next panel will be Babitra Benjamin, followed by Ravi Reddy, followed by Jihei Fisher, followed by Selvia Sikdair. Um, Babitra Benjamin, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Chairperson Mancheka Rose and members of the Immigration and Youth Service Committee for holding this important hearing. My name is Pabitra Kati Benjamin and I'm the Executive Director of Adhikar. Adhikar is, a, is a, the only worker and community center serving and organizing the Nepali speaking community on workers' rights, immigrant rights, access to healthcare and language justice issues. We are women led and our community is one of the newer and more, most rapidly growing immigrant communities in New York City. We are here today to ask the members of the committee to prioritize as you are doing immigrant, adult and digital literacy in the city's budget, especially for Adhikar. Adhikar reaches more than 10,000 Nepali speaking immigrants a year. Our members are domestic workers, nail salon workers, restaurant workers, and workers in other informal industries. Most live in Queens and Brooklyn. Our English for Empowerment class uh, has to date served nearly 1,000 members. We have integrated the cities we speak New York curriculum and also woven in over the years, our members' experience of being immigrant workers. Together, we improve literacy and language capacity in, in our community while expanding community consciousness towards civic participation, 
city navigation, support for children, and improving working conditions for all. On average, about 200 people, 90% women, attend our EFA classes a year. Together, facilitators volunteer over 500 hours a year. For almost 14 years, our staff has run this robust curriculum with very minimal support. We run EFE because our community needs it. People like Mohini, our domestic worker member at Adhikar, who said, about four years ago, I heard about Adhikar from my friend. She told me Adhikar had free English classes. And I'm very thankful because I learned so much, not just to speak English, but survival skills, getting from place to place, the train, understanding my rights. In my work, it made me more confident. I was able to be more assertive about my rights, like getting breaks and asking for pay. And that also changed my relationship with my boss. In my own personal life, I'm proud of myself. I encourage you to read the full testimony to hear about Mohini's growth at Adhikar. Access to life-saving information has always been a struggle for our community. For 15 years, we filled that gap. Adhikar was at the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis. In five months, we talked to 3,100 members directly, including EFE participants, served over 2,500 immigrant workers. We created a 15-part series that reached 205,000 viewers to help them access life-saving city and city resources. <clears throat> We went from being a physical hub to 100% virtual, and we took the challenge on to educate a lot of our di limited digital literacy members on how to use online resources like Zoom. Now we're actually piloting an EFE class online. We'll continue to expand this as we see how the pilot goes. To date, we've only received $10,000 in the last 15 years to do this work. We're asking that you all trust CBOs like ours and increase the funding for CBOs for adult literacy and digital literacy, including $100,000 to Adhikar. We submit this, this testimony to represent nearly 5,000 members in our community. And we may not know how long this pandemic will continue, expired. but we know it's increasing, the needs are increasing in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Ravi Reddy to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I want to thank Committee Chairman Chaka for holding this important conversation on this serious issue. We see allies and we are thankful for our partners on the City Council and at Moya. I'm Ravi Reddy and I'm the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. First, some context, because when it comes to the Asian American community, our immigrants and the digital divide, the context presents a challenge in itself. In our community, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a 35% increase in deaths compared to the five-year average. And our recently released report shows that our community has been hit harder by unemployment than any other group in our city. This is also set against a backdrop of a 2019 Asian poverty rate of 14% in our city and among seniors, it's 23%. As Councilmember Menchaka mentioned, a significant portion of our community has limited English proficiency as well. So first and foremost, amidst a pandemic that has exacerbated existing community-wide mental health issues, telehealth has been an adaptation our community service providers have embraced and that our city and state have graciously supported. But during AF roundtables with mental health service providers, we continue to hear serious concerns about providing mental health services that require unaffordable or unaccessible devices, high English proficiency, above average technical know-how, and or a stable internet connection. For these telehealth initiatives to reach their full potential, they must first reach the people who are at once the most in need for these services and the least likely to have access to them. And the digital divide truly reveals itself when it comes to our seniors who are isolated due to the pandemic, language limitations, and a frightening rise in anti-Asian violence. Many service providers are limited to conducting services over the phone, a significant limitation when it comes to teaching ESL and citizenship classes or conducting mental health check-ins. Many of our seniors are also immigrants, a population whom the Trump administration has done everything in its power to ostracize and isolate, and in our community, our most vulnerable don't have affordable internet. The low connectivity rate was a significant concern during census outreach, but it extends to ac accessing critical government services our immigrant community members deserve and qualify for. So if tech applications are a necessity for our community members, they absolutely must be created with the end user in mind. In our community, as in many of your districts, that is more often than not someone who has limited English proficiency and or limited access to technology. So here are our recommendations. The city must continue to support new telehealth service providers and improve its training offerings for providers and community members alike on telehealth programming and medical portals. Secondly, our partners, especially our smaller service providers, need funding and they need in-kind technological assistance while they're bridging the digital divide in our community. We need help getting devices and know-how to our most vulnerable and culturally competent ways so they can receive services as they need them. 
It's on us to make sure our most vulnerable have access to the services they're entitled to and city support for ongoing work amongst our service providers is critical to that end. Finally, we need local law 30 regarding language access to be fully funded and implemented across the city enterprise beyond 311 and language lines, in addition to amending contracts to allow Asian led nonprofits to lead with their cultural and language expertise in work with our community. So on behalf of the Asian American Federation, I want to thank you for letting us speak with you on this important subject. The work is difficult, but we are driven by the continued need in our community, by the need for creative solutions and your allyship. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome G. Hay Fisher to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I would like to thank the City Council and the Committee on Immigration and Youth Services for this opportunity to testify. My name is Jihae Fisher, the Executive Director of the Korean American Family Service Center, KAFSC. KFSC provides social services to immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. All our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. Our clients are among the most vulnerable in crisis like the one we're facing right now because of the social distancing guidelines and other safety measures being enforced due to the COVID-19, our survivors and their children are trapped at home with the abusers and face additional violence and challenges. 98% of our clients are immigrants or recently arrived immigrants who have language and cultural challenges navigating the US system. Over 95% of our clients live under the poverty line and are facing not only the violences at their own homes, but also as immigrant victims, they face a set of other challenges such as language and cultural barriers. Thanks to the city council and their support in our adult literacy programs, we're able to provide the English classes and other workforce development services and they are vital. Not only do they learn how to speak English, but they learn how to be better equipped to obtain employment, access to resources and public benefits that are available to them and ultimately living as self-sufficient members of society. Many of our survivors are digitally illiterate, especially those who are elders. Our clients just can't simply navigate the digital system to be able to receive online counseling and other resources, resources that are available to them. As most of our clients live under the poverty line, they share digital devices with other family members, which means that access to the digital devices like smartphones, laptops, computers is simply limited. We also witnessed, witnessed situations where the abusers control the victims because these devices are all connected. And because of our, our clients are, um, this means that online or telecounseling is just not an option for our clients. In addition, as an organization that runs the after school program for the children of the survivors and immigrant parents, we also have witnessed that, witnessed that many of our clients' households only have one device and the children then have to share the device for their online learning and navigate the system on their own as their parents have language barriers and, and they're unable to communicate effectively with the teachers and school administrators. For this Time very expired. reason, as an essential business, KFSC has been opened physically since the pandemic, providing in-person services, including adult literacy um, classes to our clients to ensure that we're their lifeline during this unprecedented time. We ask the Committee on Immigration and Youth Services to continue supporting the immigrant community by ensuring our services and programs sustain even during this uncertain time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Selvia Sikder to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Chairman Chaka, Chair Rose, Council Member Chi in the Committee on Immigration and the Committee on Youth Service for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Sylvia Sikdar and I'm the Program Director at India Home, which is a nonprofit and serve the South Asian and Indo-Caribbean seniors. 100% of our seniors are 
foreign born and 80% of them have limited English proficiency, uh, which uh, limits their access to the mainstream services. Despite circumstances regarding COVID-19, we are reaching more seniors now than ever before, before with the number of targeted services. These are certainly unprecedented time with unprecedented challenges. We are more dependent on the technology now than ever before. Based on the needs, we transition our program from in-person to virtual platform. Our seniors are already at high risk of social isolation and given their low level of English proficiency and they also have low levels of digital literacy as well, which exacerbates their social isolation. Oftentimes, the conversations and the training provided around digital literacy are not framed around the immigrant communities and their needs, especially for the South Asian immigrant communities. Some of our seniors even have expressed an inability to, to turn on the computer. Some seniors live with their family members and are able to ask them for help in navigating the technological devices. However, for the large population that lives alone, they do not have the social support at home to be able to navigate these processes. Also availability of devices are a large part of the difficulties faced in the digital divide. Many seniors live in multifamily housing situation in which they have to depend on the technological device uh, of family members and seniors who use the government provided cell phones are limited in activity applications availability restricting them from using WhatsApp and Zoom. It also limits the amount of minutes they can converse and stay socially connected. Recognizing this myriad of problems this immigrant senior community is facing, India Home has stepped in and we have given tailored training to our seniors in Hindi, Gujarati and Bengali. This is personalized and one-on-one -on -one so that the seniors are given the and divided attention that is needed. We also provide weekly online technology and ESL classes through which seniors are able to equip themselves with the language needed to navigate basic technology. Also, we send the flyers in our home delivered meal services, how they can step-by-step, step, like it's written step-by-step step how they can download the Zoom in Bengali, Hindi, and Gujarati. Given these vulnerabilities that the immigrant community is currently facing, we need the city's help to protect the in, uh, protect and include immigrants in its COVID-19 response. Given the high risk for the population, reopening will not happen right away. As such, digital literacy for immigrant communities and especially for South Asian seniors needs to be prioritized by the city. We have the recommendation and provide support for the organization to have IT support. This robust time expired. such as ours and uh, support immigrants are being grassroots organizations such as India Home with the expense funding and recognize our workers as essential and better serve the vulnerable immigrant aging community. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. At this point, I'd like to ask if any council members have questions for this panel. Seeing none, we'll move to the next panel. Um, I'd now like to welcome Karen Zhao to testify. After Karen, we will hear from Zhao Li Xiao, Jennifer Argueta, Tasmin Udin, and Hannah Babis. Karen Zhao, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Menchaka, Chair Rose, and members of the Immigrant committee for this opportunity to testify today. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy at this time. My name is Karen Zhou. I'm the executive director at HomeClass Community Services. We are a multi-social service agency with over two decades of providing community service in Brooklyn, New York. We operate two senior center programs serving Asian immigrant seniors. Due to the pandemic, what started as a remote experience to shelter in place to contain COVID-19 is now becoming the new reality for many immigrant seniors that we care for. Because this group is the most vulnerable to COVID-19, the CDC have continued to advise for our seniors to stay at home and avoid social gatherings. As seniors remain isolated at home, we are concerned about their mental and emotional health without their daily activities to help them get through their day. Seniors living alone, particularly under, circum under these circumstances, will feel depressed, lonely, hopelessness, and scared. So maintaining mental health and safety for our seniors have become a top priority for us. 
According to the Asian American Federation of New York 2016 study, Asian American seniors in New York, Asians are the fastest growing senior population in New York City, comprising of 16% of the population. In terms of limited English proficiency, nine out of 10 Chinese immigrant seniors can't read or write fluently. Almost half of the Chinese immigrants never completed high school. And at our center, 98% of our seniors speak Chinese as their primary language. And so when we started our free ESL adult literacy program for older adults many years ago, it was very well received and it has remained an important ongoing program that we offer. Since the pandemic, we have had to act nimbly to pivot our programming from on-site to online activities so services can be continued uninterrupted. Like the schools, we offer free virtual learning and activities for our seniors throughout the day. Similar to students in public school, not all of our immigrant seniors have access to Wi-Fi, and many do not have laptops or computers to be able to go online. So while technology have helped play an enormous role during this time for social distancing to help connect one another remotely, there still remains a large digital divide between those with access and those without. This inequity is unacceptable. We would like to advocate to the city and this committee to find ways to bridge this gap, either by providing technology funding to senior centers, I'm expired. purchase laptops or iPads, as well as supporting funding to provide Wi-Fi accessibility for both seniors and students who many, because of income lack, the ability to afford Wi-Fi services on their own. Um, on behalf of HomeQuest Community Services, I thank you for your time and consideration in my testimony today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Xiao Li Xiao to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, hold on. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiao Li Chiao. I'm the program director of adult literacy at the YWCA of Queens. I'm very happy to be here today to testify how our adult literacy services have impacted our immigrant community during the pandemic. We serve around 500 clients every year. Um, due to the impact of COVID-19, all our classes have been moved online. I still remember how frustrated our students were back in March because a lot of them were not tech savvy, uh, but they were afraid of losing the opportunities to learn English. Our teachers had to put a lot of effort in to teach them not only English, but also how to navigate the technology. It was extremely challenging at the beginning. However, as time goes on, things have changed. Our students, especially the senior students, started to enjoy the new technology and eager to learn more. They learned how to control their speakers and cameras. They became so excited when they finally figured out how they could share the pictures with classmates. Today, I actually would like to share with you a letter that I received from one of my ESL students. Her name is Clara and she is 75 year old. In the letter, she said, previously, I didn't know what Zoom was or how to use it. Now I know. I know how to make, take my homework from email and send it back to my teacher. Not only my English is improving, at the same time, I even learned how to send cute emojis to my grandson on my phone. This is a big deal for me. My grandson is proud of me and I can feel that I'm a cool grandma. At the pro, as the program director, when I read the letter for the first time, I am so proud of my teachers um, because they have put so much effort in and it was not easy. But I am not, I'm more proud of the students because they never give, they never give up and they learn so much more than we expected. Adult literacy services are extremely important, especially in the pandemic. We connect the community, the community together. So I'm so grateful for DYCD's consistent support to our community and I look forward to be able to serve more people with more help from all of you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Jennifer Argueta. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. My name is Jennifer Argetta, and I'm the Program Manager of Adult Education at Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, or NIMIC. On behalf of NIMIC, we thank you for hearing our testimony today about adult education in New York City. NIMIC's mission is to serve as a catalyst for positive change in the lives of people in our community on their paths to secure and prosperous futures. Our Education and Career Services Department aims to move people from a point of crisis to self-sufficiency through education programs that provide ESOL and high school equivalency instruction and vocational training programs that offer industry recognized credentials and job placement services. In fiscal year 19, NIMIC served more than 700 students in our adult education program and more than 180 opportunity youth in our young adult programs. Across all of our programs, NIMIC helped 46 community residents achieve their diplomas. More than 200 of our ESOL students made an academic gain. 79 of our young adult participants entered jobs while 14 more entered college or an advanced training program. Since the public health crisis, NIMIC transitioned its programs to exist in a fully remote world. This not only meant redesigning our programs to be operated digitally, but it also meant providing resources to community members that until now haven't engaged in a digital world. Our programs are vital for students like Isabel who, who became a young parent during high school. She did not finish her education. She took the test in January and passed all but two subjects. So she was scheduled to test again in March, uh, but her test was canceled due to the pandemic. NIMIC staff worked with Isabel to navigate the pathways created by New York State Education Department and obtained her diploma in June, which she wouldn't have been able to achieve without NIMIC's assistance. Isabel is now assisting her daughter to do online learning uh, and she's anxiously waiting to start college. We've seen repeatedly in history that the best path out of crisis is to invest more in people, not less. We call for no further cuts to adult education and youth services and a restoration of funds that have already been slashed. We have the responsibility and the opportunity to demonstrate our values as a city by collecting tax revenue from those who can afford it and using it to uplift our communities by supporting community-based programming. I wanna thank you for your time today for letting me speak. Um, that's my speech. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Tasman Udin to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tasman Udin and I am the Youth Program Director at Turning Point for Women and Families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Turning Point for Women and Families was founded in 2004 as the first nonprofit to address domestic violence in New York City's Muslim community. Since 2016, Turning Point for Women and Families has offered senior Muslim women in Queens ESOL classes geared towards passing the citizenship exam. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit and we started working from home, our seniors insisted that, they, that we continue to offer English classes. Due to our seniors' limited access to technology and devices, since March 2019, we've been offering our seniors' classes via conference line. It's not an easy feat, and yet on average, 20 seniors attend each class per week. And over the last two months, citizenship tests. While these are successes we celebrate, we recognize that the visual element of learning is absent due to the, the, due to the digital divide, and this is impacting our quality of service. One of our seniors who took the citizenship test answered all of the questions, but had trouble with the written portion since it's an area we were not able to practice as much. Closing the digital divide is crucial to our senior and immigrant community. If our seniors had access to tablets and laptops, similar to the ones provided by schools to their students, the quality of their education would be better. Access to these devices would also allow more seniors to benefit from our services. It's important to note that for our seniors, access to technology and our classes are not just about learning English. It's about the senior who attended our class, but who passed the citizenship exam and registered to vote. It's about the senior who came to our class and with the Metro card we provided her, learned to use public transit by herself. 
It's about the senior who came to class and felt empowered to go to her doctor's appointment and communicate independently with her doctor. Our English classes are the reason that every year our seniors commute from Jamaica to the steps of City Hall to take part in APA Advocacy Day to advocate for more funding for our Asian Pacific Islander communities. Community-based organizations like ours take the opportunity to teach English and utilize it to maximize the benefit for our community. Our classes serve as an entry point for seniors to learn English, to learn their rights, to receive counseling for elder abuse and emotional support, become empowered and become integrated members of society. We implore each of you on the committee to look into funding to provide those of us offering educational services to our immigrant communities with the resources and devices to close the digital divide and make learning accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to turn to Hannah Babis. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Hannah Babis and I'm a Master's of Social Work student at Fordham University. Additionally, I've been teaching English to speakers of other languages for over four years. As a higher education student and an ESOL teacher, I have seen firsthand the impacts that English proficiency can provide for individuals, families, and communities. I'd like to start off by sharing a personal story. In 2017, I was working at the University of Ibagué in Colombia, which is where I met Daniela. Daniela was a 16-year-old high school student who took intermediate English classes on the weekends at the university. One day she told me that her dream was to go to university in England and study medicine, but that it was too expensive. After I, after I learned about this, I began working with, with Daniela to look into opportunities for scholarships. We researched universities together in England, and I tutored her for the IELTS English proficiency exam. After months of preparing, Daniela was ready to apply. In 2019, Daniela was admitted to Birkbeck College of Medicine and continues to study and live in London. The impacts that English proficiency had on Daniela's life was certainly extraordinary, but is not by any means an isolated experience. Teachers in general provide so much more than just classes. They bring, to, they bring communities together and create access to social services. Now more than ever during the COVID-19 global pandemic, a community space such as a classroom and support from community members such as teachers is imperative. During this global crisis, New York City English teachers have connected their students to get access to resources like free food, information on their children's public schools, and so much more. As a social worker, teacher, and a community member, I firmly believe that ESOL classes provide supportive services and integrate students into their community. If you are in agreement with this statement and believe that it is important for individuals to remain connected with their community, I ask that city funded adult literacy programs are fully restored this year. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I wanna ask if any council members have questions for this panel. Seeing no hands, um, this concludes our public testimony. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that you have raised your hand. Seeing no hands, I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Chaka and Chair Rose for closing remarks. Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose um, and all the council members that are here. I want to speak directly to this last panel, uh, Hannah and Jennifer and Tasmin, and um, all of you are examples of our educational infrastructure that is incredibly important and oftentimes forgotten. You are doing right now what so many teachers that are doing for our young people and holding this uh, this shift and this pivot and this crisis moment for people who need education to give access to the services that we need. Uh, I'm also co-chairing co a hearing at the same time um, over here on my, on my right um, on the census. And the Supreme Court just made a decision to change the date sooner so that on October 16th on Friday at 6 a.m., they will shut down the census operation, uh, giving the Trump administration that ability to do that. 
how then do we communicate that to communities and what languages uh, and everything that you speak to in these moments require us to have that kind of trust and relationship and ability to communicate to our communities. And you're doing that. And every time I meet a teacher, every time I meet a, um, a teacher in general, but especially the adult literacy teachers, there's something really special that's happening. Uh, you, are, you are communicating with essential workers. Uh, you are communicating with families that want better for their children that will sacrifice their own education. And I'm thinking about my own mother for the education of their kids. What we need is a plan for all of that to be resourced and respected. And, and I just wanna say thank you for that, for that work. And what I heard today is that there's so much the city can do to build infrastructure for that kind of access to this education, laptops, Wi-Fi, um, and then also just making this whole uh, system healthier with paying you what you deserve. And, then, and if we are if we're gonna move into a whole new recovery plan, uh, it is this is where we need to invest money. And so thank you so much for, for your time and your effort. This was a long hearing, but it was important for us to hear that. Uh, and I hope that we can keep doing right by you uh, and the coalition as, as a whole, uh, as council members who are on the budget negotiating team uh, and have uh, the, the power of the people through our legislative and budget powers. So thank you so much uh, for your time and I'll hand it over to council member and chair Rose. Thank you again, uh, chairman Chaka for convening such an important uh, hearing on such an important issue. Um, you have articulated, you know, very well what, what the issues are, what's at stake and, and how important it is that we ensure that that this population, the immigrant population, our adults who are in need of literacy services have not only access to it, but that we ensure that the resources, the level of resources are there that, um, that would require for them to be able to maintain, you know, in, in the advent of COVID where we're dealing with isolation and, and so many, uh, uh, uncertainties. Uh, it really is important that we are able to maintain contact and to be able to deliver services. So uh, I want to thank you again, Chair Menchaca. I want to thank the advocates. I want to thank the educators who, who work so diligently to make sure that all of, of the residents of New York City are, are able to function and participate in the life of this city as a productive citizen. So um, I, again, I, I applaud all of you and I thank you for attending this hearing. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, more to come and uh, this hearing is now ended. Thank you.